just like. All right. I'm actually going to try to. This is going to be disappointing. I'm going to try to constrain the level of drinking. No! Uh, because I am very passionate about this particular subject, and I'm going to be pretty uh, loud and adamant as is. Um, and I want to make sure that I get my point across articulately. Um, yeah, there'll be plenty of belligerence, I promise you. Uh, so um, this talk is uh, why I'm not optimistic about the future. The first thing I want to say is, what, Drew? Are we still going to be able to see porn on the internet? No, that's the whole point. Ah! Just, I'll get there. So, so the, the um, I want to thank all of you. What's, this conference has been going on for 16 years now, and for some reason, you guys let me get up here and talk about whatever the fuck I want to talk about. And, um, uh, you, you know. Because we're not in prison yet. Yes. Well, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you to, the, to everyone who comes out and hangs out. It's great to see old friends. And uh, I, thank you for, for uh, listening to what I got to say. So, Woo! all right. Yes! All right. So this talk is why I'm not optimistic about the future. Um, uh, last year when I spoke at this con, <laughs> last year when I spoke at this con, I, um, I mentioned this thing called, um, uh, SOPA and I mentioned it really briefly. If I had any idea that it was going to turn into what it turned into, I would have, uh, probably put more emphasis on it when I spoke. Um, you know, stupid ideas get floated in Congress all the time, and generally speaking, uh, folks like the EFF are able to sort of negotiate them away. Uh, and so I just thought this was another sort of outlandish trial balloon that wasn't going to go anywhere. Um, it was, you know, in early November last year when we were here, um, and this thing really, really blew up uh, into a very, very big deal. Um, I, the context that I referenced it in was the context... Um, of the my remarks about Lieberman and WikiLeaks and how uh, Lieberman had asked uh, uh, several credit card processing companies to stop processing credit cards for WikiLeaks uh, before it was clear that WikiLeaks had done anything anything wrong, uh, um, and um, uh, and and this seemed a, an attempt to institutionalize that process so that anybody could do it. Um, but there's also another aspect to it, which is internet filtering. Um, I, I want to show you this uh, just to make sure that you understand that I'm not, I'm not beating a dead horse with this talk. Uh, this is um, Wednesday, I think, uh, the Hollywood Reporter. It says, entertainment donors ultimately rallied solidly behind the president, giving at least $30 million to Obama's campaign, the Democratic Party and liberal super PACs. So this article's title was What the Election Means for Hollywood's Political Interests. Um, and it says, there is no question that Hollywood was crucial to Obama's victory, says veteran public policy consultant Donna whatever. In the end, they came in strong. Um, and, she's, and so they talk about what Hollywood wants for its money. Uh, and the first thing they say is that they want to revisit SOPA. So I want to make it clear that SOPA is not off the plate. It's, it's not over. Uh, it, it is, a, it is a very much a real issue that we will continue to face. Um, uh, I think that, that there's sort of this narrative that, um, uh, you know, the Internet got together and they made a bunch of noise and, you know, no one's going to touch this thing again. But in fact, um, I, I, the reality is that, uh, this was an election year, and they didn't want to deal with that at this time. They're going to deal with it, you know, maybe next year or the year after. Uh, so um, one of the interesting things, I guess, about the SOPA protest uh, is that it involved a, a blackout of the Internet. Um, how many of you were actually around or involved the first time uh, that we blacked out the Internet back in 1995? Like a very few people. So I'm now actually old enough that I can tell stories about the past and, and inform like, the majority of the people in the room. So that's crazy. So I, I want to talk about, so this community, I mentioned this has been going on for like 16 years. For some reason, I keep getting invited back. Um, and and this, conference, this conference started uh, um, from a couple of, uh, there, there are a couple of communities that existed around that sort of came together uh, that, that became what Freaknik is. Uh, there, and, and a lot of these things um, had a big influence on me personally. Uh, so one of them was, was Drew's uh, radio show, uh, which he had at WRVU uh, um, Nashville. Uh, it was 91 Noise. Uh, it was on Saturday night. 
Um, I, I'm, apparently Nick is heckling me. We must protect their innocence. Uh, so, so um, you know, uh, uh, what we we used to hang out at the radio station and play uh, industrial music and, and electronic music and all kinds of other weird stuff uh, with the intent of with the intent of uh, offending the more conservative elements of the Nashville community with our uh, transmitter. Um, uh, and uh, um, uh, one thing that I learned, huh? Always a good call. Yes, absolutely. So one Saturday night, we were the last people the church people heard before yes. they came to church Monday morning. And, they, and, these, and these church people, some of them specifically wanted uh, this radio station off the air. And so they would, they would monitor what we were broadcasting in hopes that we violated a rule so that they could file a complaint with the FCC. And so we were very familiar with the rules of the FCC. Um, and that is one of the most important lessons that I learned from that. Um, uh, so, you know, we were not to use any of the seven dirty words that you can't say on the air. Now, everyone knows that, uh, um, that, that there are seven dirty words that you can't say on the radio. Actually working in a radio station, they tell you there are seven dirty words you can't say on the radio. And they go through the, the CDs and they mark the ones that, where one of those seven words is used. Now, what, what people don't understand, usually, is that, so there's this George Carlin monologue, which is the seven dirty words you can't say on the radio. How many of you know that monologue? So that monologue is the actual source of the rule, which, <laughs> so, so, so what happened is that they passed this law that said that you cannot use indecent speech on the radio. Um, but no one knew what the word indecent meant. Usually legal, new legal terms are not defined until there's a court case, right? And so George Carlin was pissed off about this law, and he created the monologue, seven dirty words you can't say on the radio, to sort of protest the law. And so a radio... What are the seven dirty words? I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> do you? Shit, piss, fuck, motherfucker, cocksucker, tits, and cunt. <laughs> so, so, so George Carlin... I don't know. George Carlin... So, so one of the radio stations in New York, I think it was WABI, played the monologue, the George Carlin monologue, at like 2 or 3 in the afternoon on the air in New York. And so this guy was like a conservative preacher, was, claims he was driving around with his young daughter in, the, in a car, and they heard this thing on the air, and they were mortified. And so they filed a legal complaint. And ultimately, the, the courts decided in favor of the, 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 the preacher who complained. And so this became the first case precedent of something that was, in fact, held to be indecent. Therefore, all the lawyers said, well, he must be right. These are the seven dirty words you can't say on the radio. <laughs> And so, and so that is now what, so in the early 90s at least, things have actually changed recently, but in the early 90s, if you ask the lawyer uh, to consult for your radio station, they would tell you, well, you need to not say any of these seven dirty words because that's the case present. So I learned that, that's an important lesson. Uh, another uh, uh, a, a source of lessons uh, came from a bulletin board system that I operated uh, way back in the day. Um, this is a BBS list from Nashville, Tennessee uh, for 1992. What? I was alive in 92, and I ran a BBS, uh, which was down there at the bottom. We eventually changed the name to something slightly less lame. When it was first launched, it was called the B -B Best BBS, and uh, I was the uh, white ninja at that point. Um, so, uh, so that was, and that board was only open at night. Um, I would turn it off every morning when I got up. Anyway, so I had this BBS. And it had sort of like a freewheeling discussion forum. Um, and all, like a lot of the people used to hang out on that BBS that I met through the BBS, uh, you know, they're actually at this conference 16 years later. Uh, so um, these were two uh, uh, sources of influence uh, that were really important in my life when I was young. Uh, and um, in 1995, uh, there was this bill that was proposed in Congress uh, called the Communications Decency Act, uh, which was an amendment to the Telecommunications Act of 1996. Uh, this act banned indecent speech on the internet or online when it was possibly accessible to minors. Think of the children. <laughs> So, so I want to make this clear. Because I worked at a radio station, I knew exactly what indecent speech meant. It meant the seven dirty words you can't say on the air. Um, now, I had said probably all of those words thousands of times on my bulletin board system, which I operated before I turned 18. So basically, Congress was going to pass a law which would make it illegal for me to provide myself with access to my own speech on an electronic system that I built and operated myself. Uh, so obviously, I had a problem with this, OK? Um, and, and a lot of other people did too. Uh, we we uh, put a lot of effort into fighting it. We blew up the switchboards. 
um, you know, everyone, every congressperson got more calls and emails than they'd ever received in the past on any other issue, and they sure passed this anyway. Uh, and so, and Bill Clinton signed it into law in February of 1996. Uh, and so, in, to protest this, uh, this event, um, people turned their uh, web pages black. Uh, and that was the first time anyone had ever done that. Uh, this is um, the announcement from a group that doesn't exist anymore called Voters Telecommunications Watch, uh, which organized this protest uh, back in 1996. Uh, and and this, this is like a big text file explaining the protest. Um, this, with a small bit of artistic license, is Yahoo's web page on the day that Bill Clinton signed this law. Uh, um, the... Uh, uh, the little blue ribbon here is something that was really common. Uh, a lot of people didn't want to change their background black for certain design reasons, and so they would put a blue ribbon on their page too. Yahoo did not have a blue ribbon. I added this just for, uh, to provide you some context. Uh, so that's the first time the web blacked out. And it was an important historical event for us. We had no luck convincing Congress not to pass this law. Everybody involved with the internet was pretty much uh, furious about it. Uh, but we did manage to create this protest um, that got covered by the national news media. So understand that you know Al Gore invented the internet uh, and actually, in fact, did a lot to try to make uh, um, the internet happen. Uh, and and uh, the C Gore Clinton administration saw this as a, a major policy initiative for them, laying the groundwork for the growth of the internet in the late 90s. Uh, and they wanted to be thought of as having significantly contributed uh, to uh, you know the future. Uh, of technology. Uh, so this was a big moment for them. And when they went out in the press and they were signing this thing into law, they got a big black eye from us because the next news story was about this huge protest that was happening on the internet where the internet really didn't consent to what the government was doing. And it really deflated uh, the story that the Clinton administration was trying to tell about what they were accomplishing here. So. Um, you know, the, we weren't as successful at convincing uh, the government not to censor us, uh, but we, um, we, did, uh, we did ultimately give them a big black eye. Um, so there, there are three things that I learned uh, from this battle. Um, the first is that politics costs money. Uh, at that time, I personally spent a lot of time uh, trying to talk to uh, people who were politically influential about the things that were happening and why they were bad and why they weren't going to work. Um, and you can actually make progress that way. Uh, you, you know, nobody is purely evil, okay? All these people, like, they want to do things that are good, and they don't really understand the internet. And so if you show up and you say, look, this thing you're proposing, it's actually going to break a bunch of stuff, and, uh, you, you know, you should think about it differently, and here are the reasons why it won't work, and maybe here's some alternative proposals that will help you accomplish your goal, but maybe in a different way. They're, they're receptive to that. They will listen. But the problem is that, that, that you have to do that. You have to sit and talk to them. And you have to spend a bunch of time reading the legislation that they're proposing, understanding it, um, and, and being able to convey back to them what issues it causes. And so that's a very time consuming thing. You, you got a comment. What about Chris Dodd? I'm getting there. Oh, yeah. I'm getting there. Okay. Uh, um, in fact, his name is on the slide uh, after this one, oh, in fact. Okay. Uh, so, so I'll get there, but you, you got to spend a lot of uh, time doing this, and so it's expensive. And so you end up in this situation, really, where you, may, you have to make a decision. If you are a, a, an independently wealthy person, then you can afford to devote your life to working on a policy issue that matters to you. A lot of the people that actually run some of the civil liberties groups that we know of, um, they are independently wealthy. Um, either that or uh, they're, they're, they have foundations that are funded by uh, millionaires that are keeping those things uh, functioning. Um, so you can decide uh, um, that if you're really good at this and you care about it to get a job, but the problem is that if you get a job, somebody's paying you to do it. And the person who's paying you to do it is paying you to do what they want and not what you want, right? So you become somebody's bitch. Uh, and so. Um, you, you know, these, these lo a lot of the people who their job description is lobbyists, they actually, they do care about, um, you know, making things better. They're talented at policy analysis, but they got to pay, uh, uh, you know, they, they got to make a living. And so they got a job working for some corporation, and now they're serving that corporation's interest in terms of their lobbying and not the, the public interest. Public interest law is, is, is a really difficult thing to work on. It's, it's not, it doesn't pay very well. 
Go talk to folks at the ACLU or the EFF and see how much they get paid relative to other people with similar training in their field. Um, it's, it's tough. Uh, and, so, and so this was the first lesson. And the, the importance of this lesson, I'm going to come back to this at the end, is that you know, people think that there are these quickie fixes that can like, remove corruption from our system. And I think it's really, really complicated. I don't think that you can um, make a small change that's going to, going to eliminate the influence of money in politics. Because the, the reality is that if you've, got, if you've got millions of dollars that you're willing to throw at this, you can spend all the time in the world talking to people about it and influencing them. And at the end of the day, you're going to get what you want over somebody else who doesn't have the time and resources to put in to make their case. Um, How can you talk about politics and not drink more? Uh, you're right. <laughs> so the second point, the second thing that I learned is that politicians care about votes, money, and the general narrative. So, Politicians care about, so people talk about corrupt politicians. In fact, politicians are the only thing in the system that has the potential to not be corrupt because they're the only person who, who's there because we all decided that they're there and we all have an equal power to decide that they're there. Um, so it's, it's fair uh, who they are and they, they truly represent us. Um, but the problem is that politicians care about votes in general. They don't care about your vote. Okay, so if you go and you say you're stepping on my neck, uh, they're, they don't care. Um, if you represent a very, very large constituency that is going to vote or not vote for them based on their support for certain issues, then they're going to listen to you. But by very large, it has to be millions of people. Certainly in 1995, uh, computer geeks were not uh, a millions of uh, a person large voting block that is going to influence um, Congress as a demo. Okay? Um, the, the, Another thing they care about is money. So if you're not a, a million people, you know, you can walk into your, your congressman and you can say, well, I'm going to give you a bunch of cash. And that does not buy you anything except access. If you gave them a million dollars, they're going to have dinner with you. And that goes back to the top. You can sit there and, and they'll listen to you and you can talk to them uh, about, uh, you, you know, why you think they should do something in a particular way. And they might listen. Uh, and so if you, if you, if you don't have a million dollars, the fact is the guy has a very tight schedule, and he's definitely going to meet with the people who gave him a lot of money. He might not meet with you if you didn't give him any money. So uh, again, money matters. Um, the third thing is, is the general narrative. So um, people vote because of who they think they are, who they think the politician is, and what they think they want. And so if you have some ability to influence the general narrative, uh, then that can affect votes, and therefore suddenly you become strategically important. Uh, and that is a factor in the a first internet blackout. It did actually affect the narrative. Bill Clinton can't say, I did this great thing for the internet because everyone at the time knew that the internet didn't like it. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Um, I haven't done my homework on that issue well enough to sit here and like respond to that. To that, it's, you're right. That was one of the first internet political issues, um, and uh, we did win. But um, you know, why did we win? Um, I, I think that. Uh, um, so, so here's here's. Let me suggest a difference. That was something that law enforcement wanted. Law enforcement has a lot of influence, but in, so this is this was bigger because. Um, the, the, the Republicans came back into power in, in 1994, uh, uh, so Clinton was elected in 92, Republicans came into power in 94, um, and, and you know, Newt Gingrich and all that, and part of the constituency that got them back into office was conservative Christians. Conservative Christians had a list of things that they wanted, and most of them were things that Congress couldn't deliver. Uh, you know, they wanted abortion bans, and they wanted flag burning to be illegal, and they wanted prayer in school, and a bunch of other things that were ultimately going to be unconstitutional. So, um, you know, the, the Congress felt that they had to provide that massive demo constituency with something. And so censoring the Internet is one of those things that they gave them. And, and that's why the weight was, was really heavy on, on actually getting this done. Whereas, whereas the, the, the force of we want to put um, key escrow in all the crypto systems was not as heavy. And so when people said no, it tended to counterbalance more easily. Um, so the third thing um, is that civil, liberty, civil liberties really, really matter. The only reason that it is legal to say fuck on the internet today is because the United States Supreme Court said that, the, that this law was unconstitutional. 
All right? If, if it was not for the First Amendment and if it was not for the Supreme Court interpreting the First Amendment the way that we want them to, uh, it would be illegal to say fuck on the Internet. In the U.S. In the U.S. Yeah, that's, a cave that's an important caveat. Yeah? There's other countries. Huh? It was a fucking landslide. There were, there were 16 senators uh, that voted no on the CDA. Um, this is not all of them. I handpicked some that were... Um, oh. Actually, this is 16 people, but, so there must have been more than 16, but it was, it, was fairly, it was a fairly small group. I picked out some people that you probably recognize, and I ignored people that, that are kind of more obscure. Uh, but John Kerry oh, so ran for president. Not. Uh, Rick Santorum runs for president. Uh, Harry Reid is the current Democratic uh, majority leader. Uh, uh, John McCain ran for president. So these are pretty pom prominent people politically in our, in our society. All these people voted to put pe someone in prison for a year or fine them $100,000 if they said the word fuck on the internet. Okay? Did they so, understand that, though? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I would argue that that I would argue that that there was enough controversy over this that they better have. There, it was it was we, we were not quiet about this. They, so 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 I want to I want to just ask real quick, which one of these parties is the party of individual liberty? Neither. Because <laughs> I'm not seeing it. Kill them all. Let God so, sort them out. Well, this is really important. So this this for me. For me personally, this was a very disillusioning moment because this was, in my life, the first time that the Congress was actually going to pass a law that very much directly affected my life, right? And, and they passed it, and they passed it with strong bipartisan support. And so when I looked at this and I said, what, what am I politically? What is my identity? I said, well, fuck these guys, a pox on both their houses. And I became really interested in the libertarians, actually, because the libertarians did some good work on this. The Cato Institute published uh, some very good white papers that explain exactly what this law did, exactly what the consequences were, and basically said it's a bad idea. Uh, and so I flirted with that for a little while. I, I have since become disillusioned with them as well. Um, so I, I want to point something out. Uh, I think that civil liberties are something that these people use when they are out of power as a way of throwing rocks at the incumbent. So the Democrats spent, made a lot of noise about the Patriot Act and all that stuff while Bush was in power. And now that Obama's in power, they are certainly not as noisy about civil liberties. Uh, the Republicans are now noisy about civil liberties. The Republicans are complaining about the TSA. Uh, you know, it's a little bit mind-boggling after, you know, the Bush administration. Uh, um, the Republicans are concerned about freedom of speech all of a sudden for this filmmaker. You know, I, really? Um, so, so here are some CDA opponents. I want to explain why the, I think the libertarians are the same way. They, they use civil liberties as a talking point, but when push comes to shove, they don't really care. Um, uh, so these are some opponents. Uh, Lieberman, you know, I'm not, uh, Biden, I'm not a huge fan of either of those guys, but they voted against this, so that's good. Uh, John Glenn, great American. Um, uh, uh, Patrick Leahy, I want to point out that at this time, Patrick Leahy was tremendously helpful to the internet. Uh, he spent a lot of time communicating with us about how to communicate with Congress. He was someone who really reached out to uh, people who were concerned about this law. Um, another person was Russ Feingold. All of these are Democrats, so I had to say that there were two Republicans, uh, um, just to make sure that, that you know that it was not just Democrats who voted against this. Uh, Yes, he was exactly right. So, so Russ Feingold, for many years, was the most ardent supporter of civil liberties in the United States uh, Senate. Uh, he voted against the CDA. He voted against the Patriot Act. He voted against war in Iraq. Um, he was recently a vocal uh, person talking about uh, uh, suspicionless searches of laptops at borders. Uh, he was the person who's saying, "I don't know. That's not how we do things in this country." Uh, so, so he, over a long period of time, has been uh, really, the, the, more so than anyone else in the Senate, a very open uh, um, uh, opponent of, of uh, uh, you know, attacks against our civil liberties. Uh, so, so he lost um, in the 2010 uh, election to a Tea Party candidate in Wisconsin. Um, and Reason, this is their blog, uh, uh, wrote a, a post where they sort of like mocked him, and call, saying the death of libertarianism. Uh, uh, curtains for Bob Barr endorsed Feingold, and then there's all these comments in the thread that have kind of pasted up here, you know, so long, Feingold, you First Amendment-hating son of a bitch, uh, uh, fuck him, I hope he dies in a fire. Right. 
So, you know, I, I, I just, I'm sorry if you are a libertarian and this is offensive to you. I, the libertarians make a lot of, of deals with the devil on the right uh, because they want low taxes. Um, you know, they, they want economic liberty, and so they're willing to support Republican candidates that they think um, will get them that. Um, if, you, if there's anybody on the left that you were going to support because you also claim to care about civil liberties, it would be this guy. Uh, and so I have a hard time reconciling this with the idea that these people actually care about civil liberties. Um, so, so having said that, I don't believe that I have any friends whatsoever in the government. Uh, <laughs> So um, this is one reason why I'm not optimistic about the future, because I don't look at the government and see a constituency uh, um, you know, represented there in the representative system that, 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 is, that reflects uh, what we need. Um, the, the, the second thing is, so let's, let me talk about SOPA. Um, as I, at the point that I brought up, OK, I'm getting protested again by Nick. SOPA uh, protects American interests, you foreigner. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I got a drink for that one. So I'm glad that Nick is here to heckle me, even though he's not here. So, um, uh, the, so I want to make it clear: SOAP is not a dead issue. It is it is first thing on their agenda for the new year. Um, they've spent thirty million dollars putting it as first thing on the agenda. Um, and that, and that, that post I showed you before, I talked about how like they eventually came around. It used words like eventually. What happened is that a lot of these people were pissed off that Obama uh, sort of indicated that he would veto the law. And so, and so they were not going to donate to his reelection. Um, and, and somehow in the back room, they negotiated that all this money was going to come in from Hollywood. I don't know what they promised. Um, so... I want to make it clear that, the, and when I, when I use the word the copyright power, um, it's actually a, a word I'm borrowing from the mid-1800s. Um, uh, the word the slave power was used to refer to a small group of people in the United States who, who were slave owners and had a tremendous amount of political power in the United States. Um, uh, uh, the, I see the copyright power as a, a similar situation. It's a small group of people who have a tremendous amount of economic power, a tremendous amount of political influence. Um, they, uh, they, and a lot of them live in this town. Uh, you know, many of you may know people who, um, you know, are part of this group. Uh, they do not believe, uh, they, they really honestly do not believe that there are any legitimate public interests at stake here. I want to be very clear. It's not just that they're cynical. They really do not believe that there is any negative consequence associated with the things that they are proposing. Shoot them. Um, <laughs> that will um, change their mind, the, the second thing is that politicians are very receptive. Please don't kill anyone. <laughs> we should get things done through proper democratic channels, please. Um, uh, politicians, politicians are very receptive to the views of the copyright power. Okay, so and I think that the internet community underestimates this. I think that we see, um, as as technologists, we see crazy shit being said by some of these people, and we see it, and we're like, well, that's fucking crazy, and so we just ignore it because. You know, in, in the early 1990s, we were used to living in this environment where no one understood us, right? Most people didn't use the internet, and they had no idea what the hell it was. And so we just we were used to the idea that we were doing this weird thing that nobody, nobody understood. Uh, uh, but that's not the case today. Everyone uses the internet. And so we tend to have this, uh, this belief that things that, that, are, that naturally make sense to us must naturally make sense to other people, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, I, I, the, 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 the copyright power does not really understand the internet in the way that we do. They don't understand the consequences of the things they're asking for. They don't know why we're frustrated about them. And I don't think we're doing a good job communicating with them about it. Uh, and, and neither do the people in Congress, all right? The, our current legislators, our current political leadership are much the same as they were 15 years ago, and they don't really understand the internet either. Uh, and so um, they're, they're very receptive to, to, to these things and, and, and uh, therefore, I think, likely to do what the copyright power wants them to do. Uh, I've been a big proponent in my local back home uh, of possibly getting somebody elected who is a computer or whatever term you want to use. Well, Patrick Leahy uh, is a computer scientist. so. Uh, you know, there is the odd, that's an excellent point. Yes, we need people who actually have a technical background who... Well, uh, that was just my precursor. My actual question was, has there been any attempt to uh, actually get a... Well, now with super PACs and all that happy jazz, has there ever been a concept of an idea of getting behind a, 
a candidate for a yes. national election. Not okay. in 2016. No, not me. Uh, there's too much video documentation that's been collected at this conference over the years for me to run for office. However, um, let me say a couple of things. So the first thing is that, that um, and I, I, I first want to clarify because I made a number of comments about Patrick Leahy. He was very helpful during the CDA debate. He was a co-sponsor of SOPA. Um, and so I was really disappointed to see that. Uh, um, you know, he kind of he went over to the dark side. Um, and, and he actually appeared in the new Batman film uh, in the board of directors scene. So this is what is known in Hollywood as giving someone the Hollywood treatment. Uh, where, where, you know, they've got, I mean, those guys have a bunch of stars that work for them, and if they want to sort of make you feel important, it's really easy for you to be swept off your feet by going to some gala event, and you've got, you, you know, some famous people hanging out with you, buying you drinks, and you, you feel real good about yourself. And maybe they put you in a movie. Maybe they put you in the board of directors in, in, in Batman, and now all of a sudden you're, you're co-sponsoring legislation that, you know, you really should know better. Um, uh, th this is the kind of stuff that happens. Um, but uh, the other thing is that there is, so Reddit made a pack. Uh, Reddit made a pack. The purpose of Reddit's pack was to unelect somebody, and that was, that was uh, the go other guy in Texas. Um, uh, that was, uh huh? Lamar, Lamar Smith in Texas. So I want to make it clear, I made a mistake there. Um, Patrick Leahy was not a sponsor of SOPA. SOPA is the House bill. He was a sponsor of PIPA, which is the Senate version. Um, uh, Lamar Smith was a sponsor of SOPA in the House. Uh, he's, this, uh, he's a Texas Republican, a very gerrymandered district. Um, they ran some ads. They collected money. They raised like twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars. They ran some ads down in Texas about, uh, you know, how the internet was. The ads were really badly considered. They were about how the internet is pissed off at Lamar Smith. And I don't think that <laughs> Republican <laughs> voters driving down the street in Texas are going to go, oh, okay, I won't vote for him. You know, I, it's just. Um, but it, I like the idea. I actually contributed money to that because I think that that we we, we really need to bring this to to a uh, to a situation where it affects elections. But you're getting way ahead of me in this talk. So how does uh, Kathy Madison, the new public body fence version 4 or 5, whatever it is up to now, actually affect SOPA and PIPA? I don't know if they do. What do you mean? So like Copy Left is a completely free version. Like, hey, you know, I put this out immediately in the public domain. No, whereas no, no, not at all. Not yeah, there's a difference left. between, there's actually a, a very specific difference between GPL and public domain. Correct. I know that, right? GPL actually says that if you're an academic institution or a government institution or you're planning to make money off of this source code, then please pay me. No. No. Nope. No. Nope. No. Nope. 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 So, so, yeah, I mean, so let me, I'll give you, let me, I'll give you like a two-second answer to this question. Let me explain. So the, if you are an artist or a creator and you make something, uh, you have several different options for how uh, you will apply copyright to it. So one option is all rights reserved. That means that nobody is allowed to do shit with it unless you say. Okay. Um, uh, the a second option you have, um, and the well, the other side of the spectrum is is um, is is public domain, which means that it, every, anybody can do anything they want with it under any circumstances. Okay. And then there's a couple of things that are kind of in the middle. One of them is called Creative Commons. It, Creative Commons is a little bit complicated. It's really a, a, a system for expressing different, more complicated kinds of uh, rights reservation. Instead of reserving all rights, you reserve some rights. So for example, you can reserve a, a combination of rights that says that non-commercial users can use it, but if you want to use it for commercial purposes, you have to pay me. Um, that's, Creative Commons can do a lot of different things. That's only one of the things that you can express with it. Um, so GPL is this other thing that's sort of between um, uh, all rights reserved and, and public domain. And what GPL says is that, um, is that, is that so let me see, you've, you've got to, uh, if, you, if, you have, if you take some source code and then you implement a new piece of software with that source code, you basically have to release the source code for your new piece of software. Like derivative works must also be open source. That's really the point. And it's, it's very complicated. There's a whole bunch of details in there. Um, but it's, it's specifically about software and it's specifically about ensuring that software remains open source. Okay, so I will, I will get there, sir. I'm gonna explain what SOPA does, which has really nothing to do with that spectrum, but I'm about to be protested again by Nick. SOPA protects American jobs. And I'm gonna get there too. So, <laughs> so, so what did SOPA do? SOPA does two things, okay? The first thing, I mentioned this before, that SOPA does is it, is, is it says anyone, anyone can provide notice uh, to a credit card processor or ad network that a foreign website is infringing, and that credit card processor or ad network has five days to pull support for that site. Okay, uh, so um, I, I, 
I noticed that few hands went up earlier when Aesthetics asked if um, anybody knew who Publius was. So I'm going to tell you guys, I'm going to go on this little side rant, especially because Wilbur said I don't have a time limit for this. Um, so one of my favorite like American heroes is this guy named James Otis. He was a lawyer who lived in the in the in the early in the mid to late 1700s, uh, and and he was actually involved in the first salvo, the first disagreement that eventually led up to the American Revolution. And many people don't understand this that the first disagreement that led up to the American Revolution was about privacy. Uh, the the U.S. government passed, or sorry, the British government passed a law called the Writs of Assistance, which allowed for, okay, uh, so I'm going to explain it incorrectly and then I'll explain it correctly. The incorrect explanation, because it's simpler, the incorrect explanation is that it allowed the police to search your house without a warrant. And the reason that they were allowed to do that is to look for do, uh, goods that you're smuggling in without, without paying tax. Um, uh, in fact, it actually allowed anyone to search anyone's house without a warrant because the concept of police did, wasn't like as clear cut in the 1760s as it is today. And so, um, and so James Otis argued that this was unconstitutional and it's unconstitutional in the, in the British system. And so the idea that you have a right to be secure against unreasonable searches and seizures was at that point, point a little bit radical, not super radical, but this is what um, Republicans refer, would refer to as, uh, um, you know, sort of legislating from the bench, basically. He was asking uh, the, the court to agree that people have the right to be secure against unreasonable searches and seizures. Um, and ultimately, that became a part of our Constitution because of this. Uh, um, but his argument was that that was a constitutional right in the British system. Um, and and he, uh, uh, he gets to, so if you've ever been to Boston, you go to the place where the Boston massacre occurred, it's a courtyard, it's like sort of a square, it's a crossroads, um, and there's a building there called the Old State House. It's an old building that was the seat of government when Massachusetts was a colony in the 1700s. Um, and, and the court, the, that's where the Supreme Court of Massachusetts was. That's where he made this argument um, on the second floor of that building. He argued before the Supreme Court of Massachusetts that British subjects have a constitutional right to be protected against unreasonable searches and seizures. Um, and it was, he's, uh, the reason I like him is because it was sort of an insane rant. Um, he started off and sort of explained that, that the writs of assistance were unconstitutional, that people had a constitutional right to be secure against unreasonable searches and seizures. And then he went on to condemn the entire British colonial system because of taxation without representation. Uh, and so he basically made the entire argument for the American Revolution. And in fact, all of the stuff that the Sons of Liberty were publishing like 10 and 15 years later was based on, on this rant that he delivered in front of this court. And he went so far beyond proving his point that like at the end, everyone was just in shock. Okay, uh, but one aspect of, so that's why he's awesome, but one aspect of, of his argument was the fact that anybody could search anybody's house under writs of assistance. And so he says, what a scene does this open? And, and he just talks about the idea that, you know, I'm pissed off at Drew, where is he? You know, so I, I, I say, Drew's uh, hiding smuggled goods, let's search his house, and so we search his house, and so he gets pissed off at me, so he searches my house, and this just goes back and forth, and it just creates this, like, ridiculous mob. Um, that's exactly what I think of when I, when I see this, okay? Anyone can provide a credit card processor um, or ad network of the, with notice that a foreign website is infringing, and there's five days um, before that ad network has to be pulled down. So that means that if you don't like some website, you know, you're hanging out on some website, it's outside the United States, and they do something that pisses you off, you just tell Visa to pull their, uh, pull their stuff, and they're, they're going to at least have to consult with their lawyer every time that happens. It's, it's, it's what a scene does that open? Uh, and they, they called it in the bill a market-based solution. And this is sort of like this, this it's, it's like this cynical sales tactic that they're using to convince congressmen who don't know shit about shit that this sounds great because it's market-based. Uh, well, what they really mean is that there's no checks and balances. Is this a legal implementation to cover their ass for what they did to WikiLeaks? I don't think it's to cover their ass. I think they want to do a lot, that all the time. Oh, okay. And so they want to implement that as a policy and make it something that everyone can do. Um, the... So I, I don't know about you, 
I, I, but, but I sure as hell have gotten um, a bullshit DMCA uh, a takedown request that affected my speech. I, I know there are a lot of people in this room uh, who, or in this community that have uh, had speech censored as a consequence of, of, of bullshit DMCA takedown requests. And so, uh, I, you know, that's, a, that's an aspect um, of, of, uh, of, of why, you know, this is unacceptable. Um, this is a letter that I got from Texas Instruments. So what happened here is that um, somebody uh, did a distributed cracking effort and cracked uh, the crypto keys that are used to prevent unauthorized software from being installed on TI calculators. And I, I thought it was interesting from a security standpoint because he, before this, uh, all distributed cracking efforts had been things that were organized against keys that you were allowed to crack, like the RSA challenges. This was the first time I saw a real online distributed cracking effort that targeted a real key uh, that the key owner didn't want them to crack. And so I wrote a blog post really early in the morning, you know, not very articulate, but it was sort of thinking about, you know, what are the implications of this and, you know, try to think a few moves down the chessboard and see where it goes. Uh, and, and so they, they sent me a DMCA takedown and they said, you've got to pull your post off, off of meme streams. And I, you know, first of all, I, I didn't even get this thing when it came in. I was on vacation. I got back from vacation. You know, this had been sitting in my inbox for a few days. Uh, and of course, like it took weeks. Unfortunately, the EFF was gracious enough to support me in this. Otherwise, I would have had no idea what to do. Uh, and they, and they, um, they, they, we looked over the post and we agreed that I had not violated Texas Instruments intellectual property. There was nothing wrong with my post. Uh, and we went through the process of notifying them that we were going to put it back online. And eventually we did. Uh, and that whole thing took a month, not five days. Uh, um, you know, five days later, I had I still no idea what to do. So, um, you know, that that five day window is simply ridiculous. Uh, yes. Adequately, adequately explained by stupidity. With that in mind, I'll should, get there. Should we? Uh, you know, there's this huge asymmetry in the DMCA, you know, process where anybody can send you a takedown notice. Yep. But it's a real burden to fight back against It's that. very difficult to prove that they did so maliciously. Is that on purpose, or is that something you think that's just they didn't think it through very well and they're throwing it together? Uh, I, I have seen credible arguments that there need to be more teeth in the, in the consequences if you send a DMCA takedown notice that is wrong. I, I strongly agree with that. Um, I, I think that there are too many... Uh, it's too easy to send them, and, and there are very few, if any, examples of people who have actually gotten in trouble for sending one maliciously. So, um, you know, I think, I think that's definitely a problem. Um, I don't know how receptive uh, Congress is to that, and certainly, you know, the people who send thousands of these things do not want more legal consequences for them, uh, um, you know, potentially if they, if they send one to the wrong person. So uh, there's, some, there's some forces that resist that. Um, uh, so that, another thing that, that I want to point out about this, uh, so do you guys remember Carrier IQ? Uh, Carrier IQ is some software that was installed on Android phones that spied on you if when you were using an Android phone. Nick says what? What does I can't read it? Yes. Whatever it takes to keep the USA safer. Thanks, Nick. Um, so. Um, so, uh, so this guy, this guy, like th this guy's a security researcher. He found out that the software on his cell phone was spying on him, and so he disclosed that on his website, along with uh, a bunch of documentation that, from the company that makes the software, demonstrating that it did what he said it did. Um, and so this company did what you know, any company does uh, when they want to censor content on the internet. They used a BS copyright claim as a cudgel, and they told him that he had violated their copyright and he needed to take that content down. Okay, so. Um, this is an example of why there need to be checks and balances with respect to these copyright notification systems. Um, um, yes? Uh, so I, something I've noticed recently is lawyers are trying to claim that they're... Oh, thank you. Uh, something I've noticed recently is that lawyers are trying to claim that their letterhead is copyrighted. So therefore, you can't post the takedown mm -hmm. notice because the letterhead is copyrighted. And then they hit you with the copyright notice on the letterhead wow. of the thing that they're trying okay. to hit you with. Fuck so lawyers, kill them all. Not all of them. Most. We had a nice one earlier. Leave them alone. <laughs> so, so, um, yeah, that's fucked up. I don't know what to say about that, but thank you for uh, including it. So, um, the the uh, so so carrier IQ. This thing was going on. I want to make this point, and that is that this carrier IQ thing. This was someone being sort of beat down with the phony copyright notice. It was kind of a big deal. 
Okay, right around the time that this SOPA discussion was happening, this was a national news item. It was on CNN. It was in the New York Times. Um, uh, there were hearings in Congress about this, okay, at exactly the same time that the SOPA stuff was going on. So if you are a tech policy person, you had to be living in a fucking box to be unaware of this. And yet, Chris Dodd, uh, um, you know, who voted for the uh, uh, CDA, um, he presented, uh, so he used to be a senator, uh, he's recently not a senator anymore, and so he got hired by the Motion Picture Association to be their head lobbyist. Uh, and he spoke at the Center for American Progress, which is where Nick works. Uh, he says, we can't stand by and do nothing while American innovation and jobs are created under attack. SOPA is the answer. Thanks, Nick. So, um, <laughs> so he presented at the Center for American Progress, and he says, I have no idea why people are concerned about the First Amendment implications of the things we're proposing. And I, I just, I don't understand how you could be unaware of this shit that was going on at the same time. I, I just, I, I really have a problem with that, with that point of view. Um, so, so um, they actually fixed this, I think. Um, and it's been, you know, 9, 10, 11 months. Uh, but they, there was this amendment that they eventually came out after a great deal of protest and a great deal of frustration had been expressed about SOPA. They amended this to include some process. So you have to go through a court to get this done. Um, I act, I'll come back to this in a minute. I actually think that with this manager's amendment, this might be acceptable to this community. And let me explain why. There are um, you know, people who, one of the things that everyone in the internet community hates is spam, okay? Uh, a lot of, and they also, we also hate malware. A lot of spam and malware is, is um, basically associated with affiliate networks that sell things like fake pharmaceuticals. Um, and there's a whole bunch of websites out there that's, that, that offer these things, and those websites have credit card processing or they have ads. Uh, and so the ability to shut that stuff down um, is, is useful for reducing the amount of malware, reducing the amount of spam. Um, there needs to be a mechanism. Um, but all we're saying is that that mechanism needs to have some checks and balances. It shouldn't be anybody in the world can send an email and, and you know, fuck up some company's uh, uh, you know, ability to process credit cards. There actually needs to be some sort of process in place. But if there's a process, then probably that's okay. No, it's not. But that's a different problem. <laughs> Uh, there was a guy in California who did some research, and he, he tied um, almost all of the uh, fake pharma affiliate programs to five banks in the Caribbean. So it's, uh, the problem is smaller than you'd think, honestly. Um, but, uh, you know, yes, it's, it's, it, this has not solved the problem, but it, I, I don't think it would be necessarily objectionable if it had reasonable checks and balances associated with it. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, you can say, you know, no, I, I, this is legitimate and I'm not taking it down, and then you move to court. Um, uh, so, so those processes exist. So, so, but are the there, problem is that are there if you are lying? only if you can prove that they did it maliciously. And so proving that they did it maliciously is very hard. They can say, oh, I didn't know. I didn't realize that wasn't copyrighted. And, and as, as long as they, as, if you can, if you've got an email that says that, you know, we're going to fuck those guys up by setting them a phony DMCA, if you've got a smoking gun, then yeah, you can, you can, you, there are consequences, but you have to have that smoking gun. That applies to you and not them. What? Why do you think we should support that with the managers, with the judicial review? Uh, because, because there's a court involved, and so they can't just take somebody's stuff down without, without actually demonstrating to a third party that there's, there's actually some reason behind what they're trying to do, basically. And so, and so people who are, who, are, who are sending fraudulent or, 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 or baseless uh, takedown requests are going to be less likely to be successful because um, you know, there's a process in place that ensures that, uh, um, you, you know, there's, that, there's, that, that, that what's being asked is actually reasonable. Yeah, no, I agree. I, there has to be some some constraint. Absolutely. Uh, so, so the, the but that that was not the end of the story, right? So, SOPA also included this other thing, and the other thing was that it, the, the Attorney General of the United States can order ISP to block access to a list of foreign websites. And so, originally, DNS was required to be the solution for this problem, and I think that that is. I have a couple of comments about that. First of all, um, I think that 
Um, that is an example of, of why this law was very poorly crafted. I don't think any law of Congress should ever refer to a TCP IP protocol. Uh, you, you, it's, it's, it makes this extremely brittle. If there's any architectural change in the internet, the law has to change. Uh, and so, th you know, that's just not the way you do this. That's why the FCC exists, so that you can have a, a law of Congress that says something really vague, and then you have this regulatory body that implements it specifically. And so the FCC should have regs that talk about TCP IP protocols, but Congress should never refer to them specifically in a law. Um, so, so that in and of itself was a real problem. But I, the problem, uh, the other problem is that that as the internet community, what we did is we responded to that by explaining that that was going to break the internet, basically, that this was not technically feasible. Uh, and and one issue is that I'll show you this in a minute. The think tank that came up with this idea had already circulated a document to everyone in, in Congress and in the Senate that said that they're going to come say it's technically infeasible, and that's because they're ideologically biased and you should not listen to it. Uh, and you can tell when you read some of the people that are pro-SOPA supporters that they're taking talking points from this think tank that produced this thing. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you, I'll, I'll show you a, a snippet from that in a minute. Um, and so, uh, and so the Congress was 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 already immune to the argument from the people that make the internet that this was not going to work. Uh, and and the second thing is that it's not really the problem. Even getting rid of that, this is not acceptable. Uh, the, the United States government does not publish an official blacklist of books that Americans are not allowed to read. The United States government does not publish an official blacklist of movies that Americans are not allowed to watch. The United States government does not publish an official blacklist of music that Americans are not allowed to listen to. And so the United States government should not publish an official blacklist of websites that Americans are not allowed to view. Um, the, the consequence... <laughs> the consequence of doing so is, is that every person who has an agenda and wants to block access to a site is going to come out of the woodwork and start arguing that their, their bad sites need to be added to that list. Um, anyway. and we, well, the, but the infrastructure for doing that does not exist today. And if you create it, um, you, you will end up in these debates. And we know that this is the case because this is a global issue and this is already happening in other countries. You have a... I, question. I, I had a question with relation to movies. What about the 1934 production code with regard to obscenity and blocking certain movies from a... I don't know. I don't know much about that. Oh, okay. It, it, that's an example of censorship that has happened in the U.S., and I can see correlations to this. Okay. Right. Right. But it, it, right. Well, it, yeah. So... Right. So I mean, there are things that you, there are books you can't sell in this country, but we don't maintain a list of them. Uh, th there are movies you can't watch in this country, but we don't maintain a list of them. Wait a minute. How does that actually work? What do you mean? And what are the books and if movies? There's no yeah. list, if there's not a list, how do you ever know if you can or can't watch it, particularly with the way that the worldwide web works? It's the, the, what happens is that the custom service comes to your door and they kick it in and they seize your stuff and then they take you to court. Um, so it's it's not yeah I mean it's not it's not clear it's not clear cut um, but you know there are categories of things that you're not supposed to access and if you access them you can go to prison but we don't maintain an official blacklist of them and that's that that implementation piece is very important so it's a global problem there are um, a number of uh, repressive regimes in the world that use this mechanism to prevent people from reading about facts that might uh, cause them to have a negative opinion about the dear leader. Uh, um, uh, what? Yeah. Um, so, but but the, it's not just used in in repressive regimes. Um, two countries in particular that have been flirting with this or have implemented it are Australia and the United Kingdom. Uh, and during this whole SOPA debate, there was the odd British guy who would show up in a forum and go, "Oh, you silly Americans and your corrupt political process." And I'm like, "You guys already have this. What the fuck?" Uh, <laughs> So I'll get back to that in a second. Let's talk about Australia. Australia ultimately has beat this down, but it has been a debate that's been going on for several years. Um, and and uh, uh, I think that the legislature ultimately decided that it wasn't politically viable and they weren't going to make it a law. It was driven by uh, um, the, the desire to ban certain categories of pornography from being accessed from Australia. Um, and and um, the, the, uh, ultimately what happened at the end, it seems, is that a few ISPs in Australia uh, disagreed to voluntarily 
um, a, a block a certain list of websites, but that website list is very narrowly crafted, whereas the original debate in Australia, um, uh, it was pretty wide ranging in terms of the types of sites that could be included. And also the entity that makes the blacklist was, the blacklist itself was secret. The entity that makes it did not disclose the way that they made it. And there was some legitimate controversy over whether uh, uh, some of the sites were being included for politically motivated reasons. And so there was, there was a real controversy that happened there over this. Um, in, yes. Uh, can I hold off on answering that? That's a totally, that is very tangential. Um, it's interesting, but I, I don't want to go off on it. Um, so the, the, the other thing is the UK. I think it's really important that everyone understand that the UK has had an internet filtering system for many, many years now. Um, again, originally, this, the list of sites that are banned in the UK was very narrow, but there was actually an incident in 2008 when no one in the UK could edit Wikipedia for over a month as a consequence of their internet filtering. Because the way that it works is that if your website is filtered, uh, um, or part of your website is filtered, the whole content for the website ends up going through a proxy server. And so, you, so everyone in the UK appears to be coming from the same IP address. Uh, and so, of course, one of those people is an asshole and hence uh, was banned from editing Wikipedia. And so as a consequence, no one in the UK could edit Wikipedia until they got this all sorted out. Um, uh, so, so, you know, no wonder Wikipedia is concerned about these things, right? Uh, it did, in fact, break a whole country's ability to, uh, to, to edit the site. So tell me that this does not break the Internet. Um, this has broken the Internet before. Uh, the, the, well, so the, the, um, the drink. Thank you, Nick. So the... Uh, the thing is that, that um, uh, the, the list of categories of sites that are banned in the UK is growing. So originally it was specific, it was very narrow, it's child porn, no one likes child porn, it's not really controversial if you're just going to do that. Uh, but they, they eventually, um, two years ago, they added uh, copyright infringing websites, which the recording industry won a court ruling ordering uh, um, basically copyright infringing websites to be added to the blacklist. So now they really do have SOPA. Uh, uh, in addition, um, if you have a mobile device, a large array of, of different categories of sites is banned for access, not just... Uh, uh, just a minute. Not just, um, okay, Anna wants me to say this is not all about, Nick wants, Nick wants me to say this is not all about movies and music. Super so protects us from counterfeit medicine and baby food. This is about national security. Bullshit. Thanks, Anna. So, um, so in the, in the UK, in the UK, um, uh, uh, um, the, the, so if you have a mobile phone, the, the categories of sites that are potentially banned is very broad, and there's an active discussion happening right now about applying an extremely broad uh, uh, filtering criteria by default whenever you get internet access. So, um, you know, yes, it's a freedom of speech issue, because when you create these things, people want to add to the list of sites that are banned, and ultimately you end up in ideological conflicts with people who have uh, uh, ideas about things that they think no one should be able to see. Uh, so anyway, I want to explain why, um, so I've, I've explained what SOPA does and why I have a problem with it. I need to explain why Congress does not have a problem with it, why they're likely to be persuaded uh, to pass it again. Um, and it says, rogue websites threaten 19 million American jobs and cost 100 billion a year. So th this, is exactly, this is exactly what I'm talking about. So this chart shows you uh, the number of recordings, music recordings that were shipped to the marketplace in, for every year from 1999 to 2011. And it also shows you the number of people who were employed as recording artists uh, from 1999 to 2011. And so what you can see is that there have been um, millions of jobs that have been lost uh, uh, over the, or rather thousands, yeah, tens of thousands, my bad, not millions, tens of thousands of jobs that have been lost uh, over the past decade as a consequence of what? I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but ultimately, um, uh, uh, in their eyes, as a consequence of technological change. Um, and, and so, uh, if you are a congressman, what you want to do is you want to create jobs, particularly in your district. And so if I show you a chart like this and I show you that, that all these people are losing their jobs, but if you make this policy change that we'll be able to hire these people again, that's very persuasive. That is something that if you feel like you fixed, you could sleep well at night.
Uh, and so um, th this is the kind of thing that, that congressmen will buy. It's ultimately what the copyright power believes. And if you ask them why all these people have lost their jobs, they're going to tell you it's piracy. Now let's talk about that a minute. Is Trump going down? Why does Trump go down to the same That's a good question. Um, so so this, this chart shows you shipment of different media, um, and it's actually broken down by 2011 U.S. dollars per capita. So this is how much money everybody in the United States is spending on recorded music and what media they spent it on. So it's a very interesting chart. Um, you could see that, that music was really popular in the 70s. Uh, it's, it sort of declined in the 80s. Um, but then in the early 90s, um, it, seemed to, it seemed to have this bubble. There was this big bubble in music in the 90s. Now, who, who can explain that? Does anyone know why that happened? You had your hand up first. But what about CDs? Uh, people were replacing their That's back exactly catalogs right. from vinyl. That's right. Track All these CDs. people had eight tracks or vinyl, um, and they finally had a medium that was more convenient than that because set tapes were not a good medium because they, were, they, they fell apart and they would melt down over time. And so um, as CDs were finally a good permanent medium and you could replace your old vinyl with a CD. And so in the 90s, not only were people buying new music, but they were buying old music that they had bought before. So if we pass SOPA, eight tracks will become popular again? Yes. <laughs> Nick wants me to drink. So... Um, so what happened here, what happened in 2000? There are a couple of different things that happened, right? One thing that happened is Napster happened. There is absolutely no question that piracy played a role here. There is a certain percentage of this decline that is definitely as a consequence of piracy. People talk about how every download from, from, Gaza, from, from Kazaa or whatever is not like a lost sale. Okay, sure, but yes, some of them are lost sales. And so there is some consequence of piracy in here. Uh, in addition, um, uh, you, you know, you, you didn't have, people had pretty much, this whole bubble was over. People had pretty much replaced their vinyl with CDs. People had, you know, the dark side of the moon on CD by 1999. And so they didn't need it anymore. Um, and in addition, um, uh, if, you, if you wanted to move it to the new medium, which was online, you didn't have to buy it again. So there was no re-replacement that occurred. If you wanted to put it on your iPod, you just ripped it on your iPod. And so not only did they lose the replacement of the old stuff, but they didn't gain any replacement of the new stuff. Uh, and so they're only selling um, new, uh, new content. There's one other change that I think is important, and that is that back in the early 90s, if you, want, if you liked a song and heard it on the radio, uh, you went out and you bought the album. Because singles were kind of weird. Singles were things that people collected because they were like completionists and they wanted to own everything that an artist had put out and they needed those B-sides, right? Um, but the, it, it was really unusual that someone would buy a single uh, and start collecting singles just because they liked the individual songs. It was just really inefficient to deal with CDs that only had one song or maybe had eight remixes of the same song on them. You, you, if, you, if it's going to live in your car for a while, you might as well listen to the whole album and maybe it's good. Sometimes you got screwed. It was an artist that had like one hit and then and, you know, 10 tracks that really sucked. Uh, but it was, kind of, it was kind of Russian roulette, right? Someone in the back. It's a, it's an in, so uh, I, I don't know if it. I don't know if I can justify that it's redistribution. Well, so it depends how you want to account for that wealth. So this gets very complicated. It's a. It's a good point. Um, so for example, if if people are giving away music for free on the internet, but they're making more money in concert sales, um, that doesn't show up in this chart. In fact, they are making more money in concert sales. Uh, and so that's, that's an important point, but I'm setting it aside. I am using the RIAA's charts, and I'm using it because I want to make the, the argument on their terms, okay? Um, but your, your point is definitely re relevant. Um, I, let me, so I'll get that question, but let me just finish what I was saying. So as a consequence of this change, you no longer had to go out and buy the whole fucking album anymore. Album. Right. All you had to do was buy a single, right? Because, because digital files are just as efficient in the form of a single as they are in the form of an album. And so as a consequence, instead of getting 20 bucks every time someone liked a song, they get a buck. 
Uh, and so that has also significantly detracted, even though the number of digital sales is growing, the amount of revenue they represent is not as much. It's about a tenth. No, shitty music, no, right? no. Your entire premise is flawed. Okay. The, the, the reason this has happened is because the music the kids are listening to nowadays sucks. It was all so much better when we were younger. Am I right? Yeah! Right! Long live Skrillex. All right, so you had a comment in the back. My my comment was that that part no, of the no, it's not. that buying buying single tracks, you had a greater odds of being able to buy directly from the from the artist, whereas there's a general rule in the recording industry that according to, according to the to the publishers, no album has ever made a profit. Okay, so so th that's another important point, and this chart does not convey that, which is what, what how much is the artist making? Uh, but 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 I would submit to you that that the that that in general there are fewer, and and that is that is inarguable. There are fewer people making money uh, as recording artists today, period. Uh, and so yes, there are there are uh, things that counterbalance this data, but but ultimately you have to accept the fact that there are fewer people who do this for a living. Um, I can. I'll give an example. I'll give an example. I will spend fifty dollars on a video game. I don't buy music. I just listen to streams from Europe. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think that doesn't show disposable income no. going to other venues, like right? Video games or people. Oh yeah. To drive in. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. In the 1970s, you had nothing better to do than smoke up and sit down and listen to Pink Floyd because there was nothing. You know, you only had four channels on television. Nowadays, you got a video game system. You got you know Netflix. You got. Uh, 150 channels on your cable TV, you know, you got pay-per-view, you got, you know, you got the internet, you go surf the web, you can hang out on IRC, there's all kinds of entertainment alternatives to, to sitting down and smoking up and listening to Pink Floyd. And so as a consequence, I'm, I'm not surprised that people spend less money overall on that uh, uh, than they did in 1976. Couldn't you say that the, couldn't you say that the desire for new music has dropped because we have access to all the old music? The, the gross number of yes, MP3s. another very good point. Yes, I totally agree with you. And the new so, stuff sucks. <laughs> God, God, you're old. The, 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 Shut up! Get off my lawn. So, so the no, the reality is that it used to be. This is like I, I thought about talking about this, but it's such a long rant. Uh, you know, it used to be that like that you. I think that people search for novelty when they're listening to music, and it used to be that you really only could get novelty by listening to new music, and there's some structural reasons for that. But today, when you have your entire music collection going back to the 1800s or whatever on your iPod, and it's all accessible all the time, it's really easy for you to find a musical novelty in the past. And so that definitely changes your approach to what you listen to. There's no question about it, and, and therefore it reduces the demand for, for brand new things. i got to open a new beer, Dick, if I'm going to drink. Could that possibly have to do with the fact that a lot of the really old music is now in the public domain and is no longer under copyright control? What music is, what music is that? Is that? Bach. <laughs> You see, Drew, there are three copyrights in a song. No, let's not go down that hole. Um, somebody got a bottle opener? Yeah. I have a microphone. All right, yes. Um, the concept of we don't buy new music because the old music is so much more accessible is good, but you're also neglecting to include in that concept the idea that the internet provides us with accessibility to a much greater breadth of music as well as depth of music. Yeah. Prior to the advent of the internet, it wasn't exactly possible to, say, fill your iPod with uh, J-pop or K-pop or yeah. whatever the word is for Hindi music. Yeah. <laughs> Screw you. <laughs> So, I, so, so you guys have made all good points, and so I think it's clear that this that piracy played a role, but piracy is not the complete picture. Nevertheless, if you are a recording artist and you are pissed off about this, which you may by rights be pissed about, um, and 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 you see this, you know maybe it's not all piracy, but it's definitely all the internet, right? It's all technology change. 
And so it's easy to get into this mindset where you just blame technology and you blame the internet and you blame these computer companies, especially when you see all the money they're making. And you look at your situation. That's right. That's right. And so, I mean, that really is the attitude that they have. That's the perspective that they have. They had this great business, and, and these computer people came around, and they fucked it up. And look, they're all, they've all got jets, and they're all, they're all, you know, driving Ferraris around in, you know, Northern California, you know, and that's my money. You know, that's, that's really the frustration. I have a jet. You need to drop acid. Not me. Uh, so, so, yeah, they need mail out, dude. So, so, um, so. So the, 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 there's this rationalization process that takes place where the, the people who are in this industry, you know, again, and I want to make it clear, they believe that, that, they have, that, that, that the money that they've lost is as a consequence of these fucking technology people and all the money they're making. They want their money back. Nick says, where's our jet? Right, you know, the, the, they want their jets. They want... Uh, they think they need Lear jets, right? So, so they're... they're, they're these people are, are, are frustrated about it. I, w I want to be clear, Congress is receptive to that. If you go to a congressman and you show him a chart and you say, I need you to create jobs and here's how you do it, they're very open to that. But at the same time, there's all this outrage about what they're trying to do. They have to rationalize that that outrage um, is, is irrelevant, that they can continue to operate and ignore all of the frustration that's been expressed. And not just that they have to rationalize that for themselves, they have to convince Congress to accept their rationalization. They have to discredit you. They, it is very important to them that no one in Congress believe that the SOPA protests were significant um, or, or that they ought to listen to the people who are expressing those views. And so uh, starting very shortly after the SOPA protest, there was a systematic campaign uh, by folks in the in the in the in the copyright industry to to discredit the people who are protesting SOPA, um, and and that campaign has occurred both openly and behind closed doors. Um, and I want to make it clear that the people who are engaged in that campaign they really believe their own bullshit. They believe the things that they are saying. Um, like Nick, Nick thinks that Google is profiting from these rogue websites. Their opposition is self-serving. So we'll get there. Uh, um, so there are, th there are one of four things that, that the copyright power thinks you are if you protested SOPA. You're either a dupe, a free tard, a criminal, or a corrupt technology interest. And so let me explain. So, so here's Carrie Sherman of the RIAA. Uh, this is an editorial in February of, of this year uh, in the New York Times, shortly after the protest. Uh, and he said, um, you know, people are, are dupes, all right? Uh, the conventional wisdom is that the defeat of these bills shows the power of the digital commons. Sure, anybody can click on a link or a tweet and outrage, but how many of those people knew what they were supporting or opposing? Um, uh, you know, but always when they do this, and, and this is not the only forum where this happened. There were all kinds of editorials like this that came out at this time. But, um, you know, they always caveat that they're, they show, they're, I'm a reasonable guy, you know. So there's some people out there that are smart. There's some people out there that, that have reasonable opposition to this, um, you know. But, again, I'm going to slander, um, and I'm going to say that the people that I'm slandering represent the majority. Uh, free tards. Others may simply believe that online music, books, and movies should be free. Uh, and criminals. And how many of those emails that were sent to congressmen were from the same people who attacked the websites of the Department of Justice, the Motion Picture Association of America, my organization, and others as retribution for the seizure of Mega Upload, an international digital piracy operation? Indeed, it's hackers like the group Anonymous that engage in real censorship when they stifle the speech of those with whom they disagree. Now, Cal Terry! Cal Terry! Yeah. What? Oh, he already works for them, or they work for him. Um, so, so uh, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I would agree that, that DDoS attacks are a form of censorship. I don't like them at all. Uh, but uh, I don't think that the vast majority of people who are protesting SOPA fit into any of these categories. In fact, I think that people have more access to the actual text of legislation and analyses and the ability to make up their own minds than probably ever in the past with respect to something like this. Um, you know, but any large protest involving literally millions of people is going to involve a few people who were duped. Uh, 
So, you know, yes, there are some people out there that uh, didn't know what the hell was going on and may have clicked on a link inadvertently. Uh, um, you, you know, that's, that's just the reality of the situation. Uh, um, uh, you, you know, another point that Carrie Sherman made in his, art, his editorial is interesting. I think it's interesting. It's, the idea is that, but, that Google and Wikipedia have a responsibility to be neutral parties. Uh, and that by turning their web pages black, even though as I showed you, that was historically something that the internet has done to defend itself, uh, that, that, that by doing so, they were abusing the, a position of power. Um, and, and he talked about the news media and the way that the news media uh, does not abuse, uh, al although everyone in the news media was definitely in the tank for SOPA, uh, that they did not um, use their news outlets to, to overtly advocate in favor of SOPA, that if they reported on the subject, they did so neutrally. I think it's an interesting criticism. Honestly, like our history as the internet, uh, uh, you know, leads us to, to think that these kinds of protests are, are important. And honestly, as an alternative to DDoS attacks, I think they're great. I think we really need to be better at expressing ourselves in such a way that does not involve censoring other people. And so a digital blackout of websites is a great way to protest that doesn't hurt people um, and doesn't censor views. Uh, but uh, uh, he, did, he did say it was an abuse of power. It's an interesting criticism. Uh, however, um, uh, the, the idea that the news media did not abuse their position is bunk. Uh, so this was an editorial that, or this was not an editorial, this was a news piece that Reuters Wire Service published four hours before the start of the protest, uh, in which they said that the protest was a failure. They said, a blackout scheduled Wednesday to protest against proposed legislation on online piracy has failed to get support of the biggest internet players. That was what the story read four hours before the protest was even slated to begin. If you do a Google search for proposed for the text of this first line, there are 18,000 results because it's Reuters, so it goes everywhere, right? It got printed in newspapers and magazines all over the place. That's why it was four hours early. So they eventually edited the actual source article because it was wrong. Uh, um, you know, Google and Wikipedia are major internet players, uh, and so they changed the headline to pockets of internet go dark to protest privacy bills, which I also think is, 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 is spin. Uh, um, this version of the article, if you search for it, has 1,800 uh, results on Google. So it's, it's an order of magnitude difference. Uh, uh, but in any event, this absolutely was an abuse of power. This was, uh, this was, this was a lie uh, that was told on a very big scale by the media that was in the, in the tank for SOPA. The party to go needs to go. All right, so um, uh, in any event, um, dupes, criminals, free tars. Another interesting criticism is that the tech industry is corrupt. Uh, and, and it's interesting because it's not entirely not true. Uh, so there's this timeline that's been sort of floating around amongst SOPA supporters. And it says that in, two, in October 2011, Ita the Italian Wikipedia did a blackout to protest legislation in Italy, and it was actually successful. Uh, and so in November, uh, again, shortly after Freak Dick, right? So there was a series of protests that occurred around SOPA uh, that started, um, you, you know, in early November. Uh, and, and at this time, Google gave half a million dollars to Wikipedia. Half a million dollars, that's a lot of money. And then a couple weeks later, uh, um, you know, Jimmy uh, uh, at Wikipedia uh, raises the topic of an anti-SOPA blackout on Wikipedia, and ultimately Wikipedia participated in a blackout. So if SOPA really, if Google didn't want SOPA to occur, uh, they may, the suggestion here is they may have paid Wikipedia to, to black it. I honestly think Wikipedia would have blacked out anyway, but uh, this is an interesting criticism. Um, uh, the organizations like, so back in 1996, uh, when we had this uh, issue with the, uh, with the, um, uh, uh, with, the, with the Communications Decency Act, um, no, there, was not, there was not a lot of money to go around. The internet was not rich. The internet was not buying and selling congressmen. Uh, it, it did not have millions of dollars to give to organizations that were engaged in the protest. Uh, but today, the situation is different. Google didn't even exist in 1996, uh, but they do exist now. They're very powerful. They're very influential. Uh, and they are uh, trying to engage in Congress in the same way that the recording industry does. So this chart, it's actually quite misleading. If you Google to try to find out who the main contributors were to Mitt Romney and Barack Obama in their campaign in 2012, this is one of the results that you might get. And one of the things that might uh, cause you to scratch your head is that the United States government was the top, th uh, the number three or four contributor to Barack Obama's campaign. Isn't that a little bit questionable? 
so, so what this chart is actually showing you is, is where the people who individually contributed money to these people said that they worked when they contributed that money. And so ironically, the individual contributions that contributed to Obama getting elected came most often from the University of California system. Uh, but you, know, you, you see some tech companies here. Uh, but these are individuals that work for those tech companies that are donating money. Um, how, I, I, I'm sure that there are much larger donations that are actually coming from the corporate entities themselves, but they're much harder to track. I did some Googling literally right before I came in here, and I found this, Obama's top uh, contributor uh, by a different analysis is said to be this guy. Can somebody go out there and ask them to move, please? Open the door and yell at him. Uh, somebody else who's not talking? Thank you. So, um, uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg, 61, um, who is the uh, uh, who is the chief executive of DreamWorks Animation and a film producer, was the top contributor to Obama's campaign. Uh, according to this analysis. Um, so I, I, you know, I don't know. There's definitely a lot of money going around, and, and um, I'm not sure that money definitely represents the people in this room, right? Um, probably we align closer to Google and Wikipedia than we do to Kerry Sherman, uh, but that does not necessarily mean that Google and Wikipedia are doing what we want, or they represent this community. Um, so David Lowry. David Lowry is the lead singer of a band called Cracker uh, that had a, uh, uh, do you guys know Cracker? They had a song in the early 90s called Low, it's sort of like this heroin anthem. Uh, um, me and you girl, being with you girls like being low. Hey, 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 it's like being stoned. Yeah, no, I want one. Fucking come and get me, you bastard. <laughs> So, so um, David Lowry, um, uh, you know, he's the lead singer of this band, Cracker. I actually liked that song. I was never curious enough to start collecting their stuff, but you know, I liked it. I don't like it anymore. Um, he's real wrapped around the axle about us, uh, and he, and he wrote this letter um, uh, this summer uh, um, in response to this NPR piece. And, and it basically ripped the tech industry. And, and, I, and I, I've got some quotations from it here. And he basically blamed the suicide of a couple of his friends on the technology industry and the changes that have occurred. Uh, and he, uh, his own suicide. <laughs> he, um, he it's, it's really over the top. And I, 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 I want to make, like the people in the tech industry, this is one of these arguments that people just ignored. I want to make it clear that in the music industry, like the, the folks here in Nashville, this was a very, very a widely read piece and widely appreciated. They believe this stuff. This definitely is their point of view. And I think that that is something that this community is not really aware of, that, that this is the mentality of the people that stand across the, uh, the aisle from us. So um, he says, you have grown up in a time when technological and commercial interests are attempting to change our principles and morality. <laughs> These technological and commercial interests have largely exerted this pressure through the free culture movement, which is funded by a handful of large tech corporations and their foundations in the US, Canada, Europe, and other countries. Um, the, and their foundations is linked to a financial statement for Creative Commons. So the idea is that Creative Commons is, is this, this, this evil conspiracy where Google and other rich people are funding Creative Commons to go out there and provide a way for people to reserve some rights and not all rights. And it's, it, and, and it's basically the point is to corrupt the youth uh, by promoting the idea of, of, of non-commercial use as a gateway drug uh, to absolute piracy and the death of copyright. That is the conspiracy theory that these people deeply believe is true. Drink Think of the corrupt. children. Oh, God. Drink I'm such a bastard. Woo. I was born corrupted. Who are these companies? They are sites like the Pirate Bay, Kim.com, and Mega Upload. Yes, there are legitimate criticisms of those sites. Um, but they also, but he goes on, okay? Um, there are, they are legitimate companies like Google that serves ads on these sites through ad choices and double click. And there's a bunch of ranting in here. And eventually he says, it's also the hardware makers that sell racks of servers to these companies and so on and so on. I'm sure he would include the people who make the fucking floor and the data center and the you know, lights. So they're just, why are people throwing things at me? Um, they're throwing condoms, wow. <laughs> so um, they're very angry that I'm, that I'm supporting the corporate backed free culture movement. So. Um, 
That's a generous place. What the corporate-backed free culture movement is asking us to do is analogous to changing our morality and principles to allow the equivalent of looting. Again, the, Google gives money to Larry Lessig, who creates Creative Commons, who corrupts the youth uh, by suggesting the idea that, um, that you might not want to reserve all your rights. So where's Lowry getting this stuff? He's, he's a little... He's wrapped around the axe. I, oh, I get to throw them. Cool. Okay, so what, can I throw them at David Lowry? So, um, no, he, so where's he getting this stuff? I'm like, well, this is a pretty crazy conspiracy theory. It's coming from somewhere. I'll, I'll take your question before I go on. You know what's really interesting is the idea that culture is a business. Everything is created as a degree. And if we don't make money out of it, no one's ever going to do it. Bullshit! Well, that's the foundation of copyright. Gosh, because no one ever wrote or created anything before my okay. copyright following. So I, I, I will, let me play devil's advocate. Let me play devil's advocate. You're absolutely correct, but I'll go back to my point that I made about politics. I, I wish that more politics was done, not, you know, out of, out of um, you, you know, for pay, but because it's the right thing to do. Uh, but the fact <laughs> is that it's very difficult in, in practice to be uh, engaged in the political system and reading and analyzing these bills and providing feedback if you're not paid to do so. And the reality is that, you know, I, I, there's lots of people in this room I know who go home and they've got a rack of equipment and they're making music and, and you know, they share it online or they share it with their friends. They don't, you, you know, they're not making money at it. Uh, but the reality is that, that um, uh, you, you know, if, they're, if they were really going to uh, focus a lot of time and energy on it, we would need to pay them to do that so that they could do it 9 to 5. I mean, that's a fact. Uh, and so, I, you know, I, I, again, I want to be as, as fair about this as possible. And I, I think that, that we do want to pay people to create art. Um, um, so, so, so Lowry, it, where Lowry got, all right. I, I'm going to say this, this is obviously some type of brain trust that they thought up whatever. So my question is, is there any think tanks for, I don't want to say progressive or, because that has connotations in and of itself, but is there any think tanks for good use of the internet basically? Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, the I, I mean, there's the EFF, there's public knowledge, there's creative commons, there's all kinds of people who are, who are working on uh, what we consider to be good public policy in this area. Um, I mean, is that what you mean? Yeah. I'm trying. I'm thinking more like the American Heritage Foundation. They sit and they just pump out everything for the free software. Yeah. I mean, I I think that. So it's interesting. Uh, I don't know if I can say this. Um, the Democrats think tank do not have someone who is paid full time to work on tech policy issues. No one's funding them to do that. It goes back to the thing where if you're going to work on politics, you have to be paid to. Well, and we so, need to start our but, own religion then and tell the people who um, join it up that if they don't give us tax-exempt money so we can buy our lobbyists and Congress people, that they're going to hell. Spaghetti monster, touch me with your noodly appendage! All right, all right. So, so let, me, let me continue. So, so where Lowry is getting his stuff, I think, is this book called Free Ride, which was published in October right before the SOPA stuff happened. And I, I honestly believe that this book was, was intended to provide uh, talking points for people on the pro-SOPA side. Um, and and um, it's written by a guy who was a, a, a billboard journalist, but I also think he worked for Wired. Uh, so he's kind of like the Benedict Arnold do you, do you know of, the, of, the, uh, of the copy fight. Uh, I don't know, probably. Uh, um, so so, um, so I, I have not read this book. I honestly don't think I could. I think that if I read this book, um, I, I would become so furious that I would go on a killing spree. It's, uh, but I, I, I've read enough of what this guy has said online and what he has written online that, that, I, that, that I know just how angry the book would make me. And this is an example. Uh, so, so he says, the music industry certainly lobbies for things that aren't good for the public. Again, I'm a reasonable guy. Uh, uh, but at least um, you know that the RAA is a lobby. Uh, and, and the BPI, they're not Boy Scouts, but they're forthright about what they're doing. Google is not forthright. The, they give money to the EFF, Google gives money to public knowledge, and, and he kind of, I don't really understand this little rant here. He says that, that Google gives money to the EFF, you know, ooh, the evil EFF, uh, public knowledge, and to all these other groups, but they're not very honest about what they're doing. 
You can say term extension is a consumer issue, but the way public knowledge talks, you'd think cable TV for less money is a constitutional right. It's not. You have no right to watch World Cup soccer. That's crazy. Uh, you know, I don't know what he's talking about. I really don't. Um, so, so he says, so he goes on and he says, now if you look at the academics, I write about Professor Lessig. A lot of their work is really shoddy. Lessig gets a lot of details wrong. Lessig is the guy that runs Creative Commons, amongst other things. Um, he says, now, either he's not smart enough to get these details right, or he's being deceptive. I would say he's smart enough. It's unbelievable to me that he's considered a serious academic. That's a pretty, that's a pretty serious. Uh, is that actually, he's writing that, or is that It is an interview. So maybe he was misquoted. Uh, but, you know, in print, in a, in a magazine article, he's quoted as saying, it's unbelievable to me that, that Lessing is considered a serious academic. Well, no, part of his conspiracy theory is that Stanford's part of the thing. So Google funds Stanford and they fund Creative Commons and they all get together and they, you know, and they corrupt the youth. And he also includes Harvard in that. He includes Harvard and Stanford. Those are probably the, most, the two most elite it's educational institutions in the United States. He says Harvard and Stanford are both in the bag for Google, and it's all this, this, this thing to corrupt the youth to change their ideas about copyright. We must protect their innocence. Thank you, Nick. Uh, um, the, the, the children, we need to think about the children. Won't somebody think about the children? I'm, I'm downloading a pirate copy of that book for you now. What email address do you want me to send it to? Don't send it to me. So. So, um, Drew, please don't. We don't need that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got enough things to piss me off on the internet. So, so, um, I just want to point out that Lessig helped write the Constitution for the Republic of Georgia. Um, and in fact, that was something he did early in his, in his career. If I, if I was personally involved in writing the Constitution for a nation state, I think I could go to my grave feeling like I had used my life. Uh, in, in a constructive way, but that guy was just getting started. Uh, he, he's done a lot of really great work, and so I, I just I found this 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 accusation by Levine to be really offensive. Um, uh, um, so so there's a bunch more here that's really going to piss you guys off. Um, so one of the strategies here, if you want to discredit people, is to accuse the other side of not wanting a solution. Uh, and so here's Robert Levine again. In one article he says, just to be clear, again, I'm a reasonable guy. I'm not suggesting that anyone who objects to SOPA favors piracy or anything like that. There are serious issues about which reasonable people can disagree. Well, I certainly agree with that statement. Uh, um, but then in another article he says basically the exact opposite. He says, but it seems odd indeed that the same lobbyists and activists find fault with every bill aimed at this. And it's time to ask whether they really object to certain specific measures or the entire idea of copyright in general. If they don't like the Protect IP Act or the Stop Online Piracy Act, what would they suggest? If now isn't the time to do it, when would be? The answers never seem to appear and the silence is deafening. Oh my God. So, so this, this made me even more angry. So this is the guy that came up with this idea, I think. Again, it's all backroom stuff, but uh, I'm pretty sure that Daniel Castro was involved in crafting SOPA. Um, and he works for this thing called the In Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, which is a policy think tank in DC. Um, and so I, I expect policy think tanks to be a little bit more uh, I don't expect crazy partisan stuff. You know, okay, this Levine guy, this is crazy partisan stuff. This is what I expect out of, like, you know, Rush Limbaugh or whatever. But it's not, um, it, you know, fine, it's in the media. This is how politics gets done. Um, this, this is the, you know, backroom stuff. This is the serious uh, um, think tank. Uh, you would expect the serious think tank to be a little bit more reasonable in terms of the arguments they're making. Well, it um, depends on who's funding the think tank. Tom. What he says is policymakers should understand that no bill tar that targets foreign infringing sites would be acceptable to ideologically driven advocates, including those who populate internet standards bodies, regardless of their claims that they also want to reduce piracy. So uh, you guys can go read this, this whole document. It's a whole PDF. But basically, he, he goes on this, this, this diatribe in which he accuses the guys at the IETF of, of being part of the conspiracy and being in the bag and not really uh, want, caring about, about stopping piracy. And, so, and this is the document that influenced all the Congress people that when, when they come and they say it will break the internet, you should ignore them because they're all ideological. Um, so again, I found this really offensive. I just don't, I don't think this is appropriate. Uh, um, I, I think this is a little bit too far. Uh, there's a comment in the back. Yeah, I don't believe in IP law at all. Um, well, all right, there's one. And I know I'm a bit <laughs> <laughs> but, but I was wondering, uh, do you 
Are you part of those internet standards bodies? <laughs> He's a pornographer. He came here. He came here and talked about DNS. No. Much like um, aesthetics earlier question, that is a big. That's a big discussion. Um, uh, you, you know, what is? How can we? you know, make things work better. I, I think it's a good discussion, but I, I, it's, it's going to completely derail my talk. So I want to, I want to pause and that's what we will talk about after over beer, uh, once, once I'm done. Uh, but I think that this is constructive. Drink. This is constructive. Uh, and I talked about this before, notwithstanding the details, I think that we could reach an agreement about this alone, that, 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 um, if, if, if there is a process involved to ensure that there are no bullshit claims, that, that you should be able to pull the, the, the ad credit card processor or ad network from a site that is clearly dedicated to infringement. Um, the, the, all we want here is due process. As long as due process exists, this, I think this is okay. Okay, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not claiming with the jury. I'm just saying that there needs to be some sort of independent decision maker involved. Um, that's an interesting uh, discussion. I don't know if... Um, so, that, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I, it depends on... I don't, they haven't specifically made the claim that they have a copyright claim against WikiLeaks. Um, yeah. Um, but it, it's, it's, uh, it, there's, that's an interesting point. I'll let that sit. Uh, you know, th that's a good criticism. We, we start off with the infringers and then we move on to people like Yeah, no, I think you're right. No, I, I do think that that is definitely in play in these, in all these discussions and, and understanding the difference between one and the other is important. And are they willing to trade a seven-year copyright in exchange for this? Yeah. No, 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 I mean, that, those are, those are good points. Uh, but I, I still, I, I submit to you that, um, you know, notwithstanding uh, Maxi Z, uh, you, you know, I, I think that, that um, the people who make the internet are not opposed to the concept of copyright. But I, I you, you know, I, I don't know. We, we can, th th I, don't, I don't have the solution for everything right now. Um, I, all I'm saying is that, that I think that it's, 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 it's unreasonable to, to say that, that we were not willing to negotiate. In fact, I think that this was on the table. And, and I, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't find everything that I was reading nine months ago, but uh, there was a specific place where uh, one of the negotiators on the IP interest side came out and said that, that this alone was not enough and they had to have internet filtering. Um, and and th that statement was made by their side and not by ours. Uh, my statement or question is, so what about other nations such as, I believe, Spain, and there's a couple others that have it's not infringement as long as you don't make money. Sir, are you familiar with what? Yeah. Okay. So, w has there been any? Well, I mean, that's why I think this is negotiable because um, because ultimately this is about making money. Credit cards and ad networks, and and I, I, I you know, if you focus on those sites that are making money, um, uh, you, you know, I, th I I don't I think that most of the community would agree that it that, that it makes sense to to, to do that, so um, and it and it does not really problem. present risk to um, you know people who are engaged in legitimate uh, speech that might be construed as 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 being a copyright violation by someone who wants to censor them. So, um, but I, I want to continue. So so this is I'm. Open, I don't want to open up Pandora's box about how we solve the copyright problem. It's, it's important. Let's talk about it. This is a good conference for that, but I want to continue with my talk because I'm already well over time. Um, there's a couple more things you need to see. Uh, so um, another thing that you do, uh, in addition to accusing your enemy of not being willing to negotiate at all, uh, is, is to basically attack the public as being non-existent or irrelevant. Uh, and so this is, this is one of the, uh, this is another Robert Levine statement. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of stuff wrong with this statement. I could sit and disassemble this statement for about five minutes. I'm not going to. Uh, but he says that basically because the CISPA protest was not as loud as the SOPA protest, that, uh, um, you know, clearly uh, and the reason for the difference is Google. And, and because Google supports CISPA and doesn't support SOPA, uh, that's the reason that you don't hear people protesting CISPA. Uh, and I think that that, that argument, um, again, there are about 20 different ways that I sect that, but Nick has something. He says, Google is profiting from these rogue websites. Their opposition is self-serving. Um, I, I think that, that, that CISPA is not as much of a red line for this community as, as SOPA. 
And I think that that, that is, this, this represents the, the fact that folks like Robert Levine don't really understand why we are opposed to SOPA. And, and so I, I, I think that they heard the whole DNS argument um, because that's how it was originally framed and that sort of diverted attention from a more fundamental issue, which is that the United States government should not have a blacklist of websites that Americans are not allowed to view. And, and that, is a, that is a freedom of speech concern. Um, I don't think that the people in the copyright interest world understand that. Uh, and so that's why these arguments are being made. Um, uh, Robert Levine said, bottom line, this is not a conflict between content creators and the public, but rather one between creators and the companies that support them on the one hand, and those that make money from their work without paying them on the other. So where, where am I? Because I'm fucking pissed off about what you're doing, and I'm not one of these two things. So I, I, you know, again, this is an opportunity, or this is an attempt to say all these people in the public who are, who are frustrated about this or protesting or expressing their viewpoint, you should ignore them, they're irrelevant, they don't exist, or their opinion doesn't matter. That's the point of this, of this view. Are you a corporation? What? Are you a corporation? No, I'm a human being. Well, there you go. <laughs> no, hold on, because that's not entirely valid. Hmm? Why not? You're having consumed a whole bunch of that. So by that standard, you're a creator. Okay. So you do fall in one of those categories, which doesn't in fact mean... Yeah, I'm a content creator, but I'm not, I'm not on the side of people that support SOPA. Okay. Um, so what, what he say, when he says content creator, he means the copyright power. Okay. Um, so so um, uh, this, this is, in fact, the single most corrupt thing that I have ever seen in print about our system of government. Uh, and, and, and so this is Leo Hindry. I don't know who he is, but he contributed more than three million to Democratic candidates and groups. Uh, um, and uh, he says, uh, SOPA is an issue that has no business being decided politically by anybody on one side or the other. The fact that it might be becoming a political issue is unfair to content producers. So the fact that the public is aware of this issue and expressing their point of view is unfair, says a guy who spent three million dollars donating to Democratic political campaigns. I mean, this is, this is unashamed. This was in the media. He was, he was taking an interview from a reporter and basically said, I bought off these politicians. We need to have this discussion in the back room. And the fact that the public is involved is unfair to me as a consumer of, of, uh, of politicians. Uh, I'm, I'm really deeply offended uh, by, by, this, by this point of view. This is unacceptable. Um, Shoot him. All right, he works for Intermedia. I bet there's people in this room that work for him. Um, Huh? No, no, he's saying that it has no business being decided politically, which means that it, the public should not be involved. This is a backroom discussion. Um, uh, the, the things, get, things get passed in a law all the time that you don't hear about. It, I mean, basically not discussed in the press is what he's saying. Like, yeah, I mean, they pass laws all the time uh, that, that are not political issues, that are not you know, discussed in the press, that people are not aware are happening. Uh, you know, yes, ultimately everything's open and you can find out, uh, but his point of view is that people have promoted this, that what they're saying is the tech industry did something wrong by, in, by communicating to the public about this. That, again, they, they assert that, um, you know, the things that Wikipedia was saying about censorship and the things that Google was saying about censorship are, are completely ridiculous because this law has nothing to do with freedom of speech. Okay, and so and so basically, what they were doing is manipulating the public into believing something that was completely false. That this had something to do with freedom of speech in order to get them to express opposition. And so, and th their point of view is th is that the whole protest was bullshit. That this has nothing to do with freedom of speech. That there are no legitimate First Amendment concerns whatsoever with this intellectual property stuff. And and so and so that that was all bullshit. There was there was it was wrong for it was Google Google abused their power by putting it on their website. They lied when they said it was a freedom of speech issue. All the people who protested were completely duped by this. They had no idea what they were protesting. Um, and it's and and that's their that's their view. That whole process was was wrong in in, in their eyes.
Now, I want to I want to make something clear. I, I've sort of allowed their criticisms criticisms of Google to stand here. Google, I think, indicated that they were considering engaging in this in this in this blackout to protest SOPA, but they did not officially announce that they were doing so until right before the day when the protest started. So there were tens of thousands, if not millions, of websites that that signed on to this protest on their own without Google having been involved. Uh, the reason for that Reuters article is that four hours before the protest occurred, it was not clear that Google was going to be engaging in the protest. It was not clear that Google was going to black out their site. So all these other websites that, that contributed to this, they did so without guidance from Google. They did so on their own because they disagreed with the law. Um, and, and so um, this argument that this protest was orchestrated by Google and, and was orchestrated by people who were attempting to manipulate the public is completely bunk. It is absolutely false. And the reason that Google did not uh, organize the protest was to help the protest be self-evident. Uh, they, they got involved at the end because they knew that if they got involved earlier, that it would look like they were orchestrating the whole thing. It's actually more ironic than that because you could make a fairly good argument that uh, Reddit certainly had a lot to do with the organization. Oh, absolutely. But then look at who their parent company is. It's that very same group. Yeah, but Reddit is an open community. It's you know, and I look at, look at who owns them. At the end yeah, of the you're right. You're right. So the 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 it's 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 important to understand that that both not just because it's in their interest, but be, you, they want to believe their own bullshit. They really do believe this conspiracy theory. They really do believe that 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 it's Sergey or whatever in the back, with, you know, he's the puppet master and all these people are, you know, his, 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 his idiot minions uh, and, and that all of this is bullshit. They really do believe that. Absolutely. No, 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 absolutely. They believe that this is true. They, 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 they do not see any legitimate, they don't understand, they don't understand the internet, they don't live in this world, they haven't been subject to phony DMCA requests, they don't understand what we do with this medium, and, and they, they, don't, they don't know what the history is. And so they just, they're just completely unaware of it, and they, they, they encounter people on the internet that don't know what they're talking about, and, and they have just said, oh, it's all bullshit. Uh, and, and they, they really just do not understand. Um, and and I, again, I think the fact that we that 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 the that the internet community really focused on DNS as being the problem with SOPA, as opposed to the blacklist being the problem with SOPA, helped their misunderstanding because they're like, oh, it's a technical problem. They say it's going to break the internet, but my engineer says it's not going to break the internet. Uh, and so I believe my engineer. And instead of it being more of a social argument about how you run a society and the fact that 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 that, that that's not the right way to do things. Um, but anyway, um, you know, David Lauer, this is, he's responding to me. He says, why are you guys always so angry? You were illustrating my point about the mob mentality of the free culture movement. Angry at artists who don't agree with you. Uh, Robert Levine, the internet community is always in a complete lather. They operate on one setting, hysterical. <laughs> so, um. We operate in Bronx, too. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. No, that really pissed me off. So, um, so why the hell did we win? Uh, the reason that we won is that there were millions of people contacting Congress. Not the hundreds of thousands or whatever we probably organized back in 1995, but millions of people, um, of seven or eight million. Um, and, so, and so it was an election year. They knew that, that we were going to go to the mat on this. If they continued to pursue this, if they passed this into law, that those of us who were really pissed off about it were going to continue to fight them, and we're going to target the people who voted for this thing in their, in, their, in their upcoming election. They had no idea how big it was. It was a wild card that they did not predict, they did not understand. And so going into an election year, they said, that is not something I want to deal with. And so support for the law, for this, you know, it, it, it fell apart because these guys are looking at getting reelected in a few months. They got to run a campaign. They know a lot of people are pissed about this, and it's just like, why? Well, we can do this later. Let's just set this aside right now because I don't understand this well enough to manage it in my campaign. That's why we won. We did not win because Congress was convinced that we're right. We did not win because Congress believes that that we that uh, you know that 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 SOPA is a bad idea. 
we won because they were afraid of, of the consequences politically this year. Uh, and so um, this year's over. The election is over. We're not going to have another one for two years. Uh, and uh, Hollywood um, has this as their top agenda item coming back in uh, with the new Congress this year. So, um, you know, we're going to hear about this again, and we're going to hear about it in a context where uh, they are less concerned about the consequences of pissing us off. Uh, so, so this is going to come back. Um, yep. Yep. Over 9,000. Over 9, <laughs> more people get together to protest Westeros than that. Or something. Yeah, but the, you know, Scientology can follow a menu with their daily lives. This You've never been to Tampa. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I, I think that, I, again, I, I think that the people who are supporting this do not appreciate how much an internet blacklist is a red line for people in the United States. And I, and I, 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 I do think that they, again, they, continue, they, they believe, they have rationalized themselves that this protest was entirely this bullshit exercise by Google. All these people were confused. They had no idea what they were talking about. They really believe their own bullshit. So they are going to try it again. I do agree with you that, that they're going to find that, that it, it, that, that the opposition to this is 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 quite forceful, um, and it, it's going to be nasty. And that's basically what I'm saying. I, I think that that uh, um, we can't we can't negotiate with people that don't think that the IETF is a corrupt institution, right? We we can't we have no basis for a conversation with them if they if they're throwing those kinds of rocks at us. And so it's going to be a fight. And and I think that that um, you know it's going to be it's going to be a, 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 a you know this is why I'm not optimistic about the future. I don't know what the hell is going to happen next year, but I think it's going to be really ugly. Um, and and I I hope that it's again people in the you know we, we we have the ability to protest in legitimate ways. I don't think denial of service attacks are the right answer. I, I think that um, uh, you, you know we need to show these people that we are politically potent. That's why I I, I contributed money to the pack that was going after uh, that guy in Texas because I think that that's the right way to go about this, we need to actually demonstrate that we can take a candidate out. Okay, we need to get someone unelected. Um, and, and we need to demonstrate, because this is a large group of people at this point. This is an issue that touches millions of people in this country. And so I, I think we really do have the power here uh, to, to be one of those big demos that's, that's important to Congress people because they represent a massive voting block. Um, and and, and if, we, if we are not capable of that, if we cannot uh, uh, have a, a, a political consequence for some of these politicians, ultimately we're going to lose. To be politically respected, you have to be politically feared. Right, that's right. I mean, it's like, it's, it's like, it's like the first wow. day, the first day in prison, you got to kick somebody's ass, otherwise you'll be somebody's bitch. I, I think that's the reality. We got to, I, I, I do think that we got to, we got to kick somebody out of Congress. We got to show them that there are enough people who care about this, enough people who understand what it is and, and, and are pissed off about it that, that they can in fact affect the election and yeah. someone will not get reelected. If, if you start unelecting motherfuckers, right. motherfuckers pay attention. That's right. Uh -huh. I, no. <laughs> they sodomize me every day. <laughs> For Tom in 2016. But if you feel led in that direction, then maybe you should. And I, I mean, but I, I got another point to make here, and this is the concern. I mean, you, you know, the reality is that we are not, we, we don't have to just rely on each, on each other because we have Google. We didn't have Google 15 years ago, but Google's very rich. And Google is, in fact, and spending millions of dollars to, to affect this situation. Um, and one big piece of evidence that Google is willing to play with that first bit of it is uh, they're already to an extent with their morality codes with Google ads um, in, in stuff that is perfectly legal yeah. where yeah. people are doing stuff. They'll pull your ads if they don't like yeah. what they're seeing. So this is my point. We're not running the communities anymore, and, I, and I'm concerned about that, right? So, so um, uh, you, you know, it used to be in, in 1995, you know, we were running the communities. They were all small communities. We ran them. If there was a federal law that applied to BBSs, then we were all going to have to deal with it, right? But, you know, I run this website, Meme Streams. No one uses this site anymore. Everybody uses Twitter, Facebook. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, people use Twitter and Facebook. Everybody uses Twitter, Facebook, and Google Plus if you haven't been kicked off of it yet. Uh, sorry, <laughs> aesthetics. Uh, so, so the... 
the, the, the reality is that, that there are a handful of very wealthy players that control the communications that we engage in on the internet today. And, and they do have, have all kinds of policies that we may or may not agree with. Uh, so I got kicked off of Twitter um, during the first SOPA debate. I don't know what happened. I honestly have no idea. Uh, my account was just suspended. Uh, I spent several uh, weeks trying to get in touch with them um, and getting form letters, and eventually they re-enabled my account. They've never provided me with an explanation. Uh, and it was a very interesting experience for me because I got to the point of I was using Twitter every day. Twitter was a way that I communicated with people that I knew. It's sort of, a, it's sort of like email. It was pretty fundamental. And all of a sudden, one day, it's gone. And, and I, I have no idea why. No explanation was ever given to me. There was an appeal process, but it took weeks to go through. And eventually, I got it turned back on, but I still don't know why. And so, you know, I think, I think that we, we have um, uh, some reasonable questions to ask about what are the rules that we want to apply in these communities. Um, and I don't necessarily think that, that the rules that apply in those communities today are the rules that we want. Uh, but, you know, to me, I don't know, maybe what am I fighting for here? You know, I, I used to I used to be prepared to go to the mat on these issues because I used to run the communities and, and you know, we, the communities were small things that we all ran together. Uh, but now it's a couple of rich guys that run these communities and they have millions of dollars and they can defend themselves against Congress without my help. And so, yeah, I mean, I think if the Internet, if the real Internet community that is represented by the people in this room wants to make a statement politically, then we need to unelect some motherfuckers. But the reality is that maybe it doesn't matter because we're not in control anymore. And there are rich guys who can go in and negotiate with the other rich guys and they can cut some deal. And at the end of the day, they're the ones who are gonna have to deal with it. So that's another reason why I'm not optimistic about the future uh, because the situation is different now. Uh, and, and realizing that, um, you know, is, is, I don't know, I am concerned that, that um, you know, there is some day when we're gonna need to take control of these communities back, uh, but we're not quite there yet. Huh? Who? Never heard of it. Probably not. All right, guys. So, so I got another section to this presentation, um, which I. Yeah, I mean, it's it's basically. I think we should. I think we should call it unless you guys want to hang out for another fifteen minutes. You guys have to decide, up or down. All right. The people have spoken. So, all right. So, I want to go back to my lessons from the CDA battle. The, so, first of all, politics costs money. Secondly, politicians care about votes, money, and the general narrative. And third, civil liberties really matter, and no one cares. How do we fix these problems? I think Larry Lessig has it right, okay? I think focusing on SOPA as an issue is, is, I mean, we need to win that fight. We've got to win that fight. But the reality is that, that it's, it's, it's uh, you, you know, it's not the big picture. The big picture is that our system is fucking broken, and that's why these things happen in the first place. And so we need to think about the system. And this is what Larry Lessig does. He doesn't do copyright anymore. He's done with copyright. He had no role whatsoever in the SOPA debate. He is, he is focused 100% of his energy on how Congress actually works and how to unfuck Congress on a fundamental level um, and, and that, that addresses all kinds of issues. Uh, and so I, th I, think we, I think he's right. I think we really need to be thinking that way. Um, and so how do we fix this? Um, I have one point I want to make, which was the original point of this presentation before I got pissed off about SOPA, uh, and that was that I think anarchism is a cop-out. Uh, and um, I want to explain that. There are three branches of government. Um, there are three components of government. I think that this is, is universally true. There's, there's three things that government does. The first thing is that they have a legislative branch. They decide what the rules are. Um, uh, you know, secondly, they have a judicial branch. They decide whether or not someone has broken the rules. And the third thing is they have an executive branch. They take action when someone breaks the rules. Um, those are the three things that government does. So i got a lot of friends who, you know, in disgust with the system, have decided that they are anarchists, right? And, and what anarchists talk about is direct action often. They say direct action gets the goods, okay? Um, and, and so this is my problem with direct action anarchism. Like the idea that, you know, you're going to go liberate the monkeys from the animal testing plant uh, yourself. Um, there, there, there are three problems, basically, uh, w relating that to a system of government, the way that that works is that you have decided what the rules are. Uh, there's no process. You are deciding 
uh, that, that you don't like this thing that someone is doing. Uh, and then you are deciding when someone has broken the rules. You've decided that this animal testing plan is testing on animals, and you've decided that that's not okay, even though the government says it's, it, it is. And then you are taking action to punish those people for, for violating that rule, right? Um, so so that, that's my problem with direct action is anarchism. It's exactly the same thing as totalitarian dictatorship. The way totalitarian dictatorship works is I decide what the rules are, I decide who's broken the rules, and I take action when someone broke the rules. And so, you know, people in the direct action anarchy community, like when they're, when they're um, you, you know, when they're talking about like, when you go like, well, what about Bolshevism and the things that happened in Russia in the, in the early 1900s? They're like, oh, we don't want that. We want something different to happen. But the reality is that what happened in Russia is a natural product of the way that they think. Uh, they, they, they essentially have a, an authoritarian view. And so, to me, direct action anarchism and totalitarian authoritarianism are exactly the same thing. They're the same thing. And so, and so really, the, the reality is that you're never going to agree with every policy in a free society. There's going to be some bullshit laws, I'm sorry, because we're weird, and normal people are going to be in charge of figuring out how things work, and they're going to do things that piss us off. That, at the end of the day, that's always going to be the case. Um, Finding something to disagree with is easy. Um, coming up with a process that would make better choices is very hard. Uh, and so it's easy to say, I don't, like the, I don't like what the government is doing, so I'm going to become an anarchist because fuck it, right? It's much harder to say, I don't like what the government is doing. If they were slightly different in this specific way, maybe they wouldn't make such stupid decisions anymore. Um, I, I, that's a very challenging thing, and I think it's—I think that's why people people turn away in disgust because th because actually engaging is really a lot harder. Um, uh, so I, I go back to to my lessons from the CA battle, and and I, honestly, I think this is what we need to think about: how do you build a fair process that that would not do these things, that would not be so corrupted by money? Um, and I, I I don't know. I have some ideas. Um, and, and I, so first of all, the, I'll explain each one. One is require people to vote. Uh, this is not my idea, it's somebody else's idea. Uh, but, but the idea is that, that right now a lot of our political process has to do with trying to get the vote out. And so both parties are trying to get their partisans to the polls. And so they spend a lot of money trying to focus on that and every dollar could be another vote. Um, if, in Australia, everyone is required to vote. If you don't vote, you, you, you're fine. And so like, they have turnout on the order of like 92 or not to 95 percent of the society. And so as a consequence, the, Australia is not perfect. In fact, Australia almost you know, had an internet filtering law. But Australia is, 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 um, is a place where politics functions differently from a partisan aspect. It's not about trying to get the vote out. It's about encouraging voters to agree with your point of view. And so as a consequence, it's a little bit less partisan. Uh, so I think that's a valid idea. It's not going to solve the problem, but it, I think it's an ingredient that's interesting. Um, another one is that people need good nonpartisan information resources. You saw my presentation maybe a couple of years ago where I was talking about how um, you know, we're asking people to make choices. We need to inform them about what choices we're actually asking them to make and instead of letting them rely on all this advertising um, and allowing money to drive the process as a consequence. Uh, the third thing is that the, the public should fund policy analysis. So this is a fucked up idea. Basically, I think we should raise the salary that congressmen get paid. And that sounds fucked up, doesn't it? That's counterintuitive to everything we think, because we think, oh, these corrupt politicians, right? God, we don't want to raise their salaries. You know, they just want the money. You know, but the reality is that the, the people who are elected are the only people who have a chance of not being corrupt, because they are the only people that you actually pay. Okay, you don't pay the lobbyists. Um, and the lobbyists are very well paid by interests that want to get certain things done. Uh, but you pay the politicians. And so the more you pay them, and ultimately the larger their staffs, the more people who actually represent you who get to think about policy issues. And so if I'm a politician and I get this very small budget for my staff, I'm very reliant upon lobbyists to tell me what to do because I can't spend a lot of time thinking about what the legislation should consist of. I can't do a lot of my own research because I can't afford it. Uh, but if I've got a big staff and I've got lots of money, uh, I can have people go, you know, sit in the Library of Congress for a year and figure out this thing. And, and they're doing so um, ostensibly in the public interest, more so than certainly than the lobbyists. Or they could buy four houses. Or they could buy four houses uh, because you need that if you work in D.C. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I, these ideas are controversial. I, I don't think I've figured this out. I, all I'm doing is I'm, I'm trying to start a conversation. You know, we can talk about how to fix copyright. I, I don't know how to fix copyright, but I really, I think what we need to do is fix Congress. Uh, and, 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 and that's the discussion that I, I want to leave you guys with.
rather than just straight up pay them more, set up a fund where if they do X or they, they're shown to actually do X, you could match that, and then it would be a fund that would that would that would fund their staff, and it would be specifically for that, mm -hmm. rather than ex so uh, you know, have. It is, but then there's other there's other ways there's other accounting tricks that you can do. Uh, non -profit non -profit accounting. Yeah. And then they'll go for nap to anyone. Kill them all. Are you doing it on my laptop? Yeah. Um, okay. So um, uh, while we're talking about this, uh, Anna is going to pull up a, a video, uh, which is um, does a good job of mocking me. You're going to want to plug that audio in. Our representative actually brought this up in a town hall meeting. Oh, really? Yeah, so, yeah. So that's when he's not working in your interest. He's working on getting his buddies elected. And, and it's something he even said he didn't like. Yeah. He wants their support. He's required. Right, and he and again, he's their money, or he's not going to get elected at all. It's, it's fun to people who are who who represent us who do policy analysis is really what it is. Yeah. So the marginal utility of each bribery dollar. That's right, exactly. Yeah, that's true, but it's very hard to spend more dollars than are potentially available for bribery in our system. Um, the uh, so so Rattle wants me to remember what happened to Hitler. Um, and I think that that will become clear later. Sir. Das ist dem Feind gelungen, die Front in breiter Formation zu besprechen. Im Süden hat der Gegner Zossen genommen und stößt auf Stanz. We're not We're not ready for this yet. We're still talking. All right. Uh, I had an evil idea that I'm going to share. Is there a way to delete a policy? Is there a way to delete a policy from Google's database when it just disappears? Why would you want that? Oh, that's so, true. So, yeah. 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 Uh, censorship. Uh, well, well, censorship. But I, I strongly suggest committing any crime in the fruition of figuring out how to solve these problems. That, that is my answer to that question. Didn't, didn't, I think you had a few examples of that in your presentation. <laughs> So, I mean, but that's, that my point is that, like, I think, I, I'm not going to tell you that campaign, I'm going to, I'm not going to tell you that campaign finance reform is a bad idea. What I'm going to tell you is that it's not going to fix the problem because the, because the lobbyists have to get paid and the lobbyists are the problem. And so it's, Shoot the lobbyists. what the, 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 giving campaign finance reform might give politicians a certain degree of independence where they feel less beholden to the people who paid for their campaign. And they want that. Uh, they're open to it, but the problem is, and so there, there's some, I'm not going to say that's invalid, but the, the, the issue is that, they, that they're still intellectually beholden on those lobbyists because otherwise they don't know what to do. And, and, and fixing that problem is, is more complicated than, than they're, they, although, they're, although they're somewhat financially disconnected from those people, they still need them to tell them what legislation to pass. And so. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. No, no, they, no, no, they, no, no, they do. They really do. They really believe them. And, and again, uh, what hap one of the things that happened sideways on SOPA is that the guys that wrote it th distributed that white paper that basically, you, you know, threw a rock at the IETF. And, and like, these congressmen, they don't know left from right. So th they've already had like a serious Washington think tank tell them, ignore anything the IETF says about DNS. And so they're, and so, and then it happens just like the, uh, the policy think tank said it would. And oh my gosh, these people must be lying to me. I won't listen to them. You know what I mean? I mean, uh, you, you know, folks in the folks in folks in DC, you, you know, are are subject to, to to believing things that they're told, particularly if it involves creating jobs for people. Yeah. Ted's 
Ted Stevens voted for the CDA too, but I took his name off because he passed away a couple years ago. Uh, um, but uh, I was going to include him because everyone knows that guy. Uh, yeah, but I mean, the, the reality is that they have no idea. They have no idea how the internet works. And I think that that's important because we tend to think that everyone gets that this is stupid. Right? And so only crooked people could, could support it. And I think that's not true. I think that the people who are supporting it honestly believe that it makes sense. And they don't understand our objections because they're so far removed from our perspective. And I think that that is really the risk that we face. Uh, that, 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 um, that in our bubble on the internet, these things are so obviously stupid that we, we don't recognize the fact that people genuinely don't agree, uh, don't agree with us. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, yeah. You just sound like crazy people. Yeah. And so a lot of the um, things that you guys think you're doing that are sort of anarchist or, or protest or whatever, actually, I think, if anything, weaken the argument. Oh, yeah. And make yourself sound even less sane and reasonable. Totally. And Yep. There's, there's no doubt that, that things like DDoS attacks, for example, detract from our credibility. Um, and, and uh, you know, y yes, people don't understand what we're talking about. Yeah, I, I think your point is completely valid. Um, and I, and I, I, I don't know how we can, um, I mean, what do you, what, so, so let me turn that back around on you. I'm, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but how do you think we should be communicating with the public? name do you think Fox News would allow people on there who would argue competently against what they're oh, trying yeah, to push? Maybe MSNBC or... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's good. It is. I, I think that the EFF is a... Um, there are different kinds of groups. I think we need more politically oriented tech groups. Like, EFF is like a... There's like a tax rule where, where you can be, you can, either, you can either comment on elections or not, right? You're either a nonprofit or you're not. And so all of our tech group, policy groups like Public Knowledge and EFF, they're all nonprofits. And so they can't, like, they can't specifically endorse uh, a, a candidate, for example. And so if we had more uh, uh, you know, politically oriented tech groups that were more like the Heritage Foundation or the, the uh, Center for American Progress that are, that are clearly politically uh, um, engaged, uh, you know, they could be those guys who get on Fox News or, or any of these networks who are, who are, I am a technology partisan, I am not a nonprofit, I'm, I, I am here to tell you not to vote for this guy, and, I, and they can go out and they can say things that the EFF can't say because they're pro prohibited from doing so by the tax code. Me? Yes. Will you play Hitler's reaction to soap and then throw condoms at people? Before we do that, I will take his question, and that is it. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it, it really points a bigger political issue to have. In this country, the United States, we don't look to the scientists and technology as leaders. You know, we, we look to ex football players. <laughs> we have typically elected citizens in Congress, a handful of doctors and engineers. If you look at the uh, leadership of the uh, Communist Party in China, who are having their meeting with elected leaders this week, uh, more than half of those guys have engineering degrees. You know, if you look in Europe, almost like you know, a large fraction of them, uh, Angela, Angela Merkel has a chemical engineering degree. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. I, I think that the I think that technologists should at least be on par with religious people in terms of their political leadership positions, but they're definitely not. Um, I see Jesus scientists relying to us. 
So, so now, um, in a spirit of, of not being too serious about ourselves, uh, um, I will show you uh, what I just looked like um, uh, uh, if I was Adolf Hitler. Der Gegner zossen genommen und stößt auf Starnsdorf vor. Der Feind operiert jetzt am nördlichen Stadtrand zwischen Frohnau und Pankow. Und im Osten ist der Feind bis zur Linie Lichtenberg, Marsdorf, Karlshorst gelangt. Mit dem Angriff Steiners wird das alles in Ordnung kommen. Mein Führer, Steiner, Steiner konnte nicht genügend Kräfte für einen Angriff massieren. Der Angriff Steiner ist nicht erfolgt. Jorge, Krebs und Potter. Das war ein Befehl! Der Angriff Steigers war ein Befehl! Wer sieht sie? Jeder hat mich belogen, sogar die SS. Die gesamte Generalität ist nicht zweiter als ein Haufen niederträchtiger, treuloser Feiglinge. Mein Führer, ich kann nicht zulassen, dass die Soldaten, die für Sie verbringen... Ich setze Feiglinge, Verräter, Versager! Mein Führer, was Sie da sagen, ist ungeheuerlich. Die Generalität ist das Geschmeiß des deutschen Volkes. Sie ist ohne Ehren! Sie nennen sich Generale, weil Sie Jahre auf Militärakademien zugebracht haben, nur um zu lernen, wie man Messer und Gabel hält. Jahrelang hat das Militär meine Aktionen nur behindert. Es hat mich jeden Morgen mit dem Widerstand in den Weg gelegt. Ich hatte gut daran getan, von Jahren alle höheren Offiziere registrieren zu lassen, wie Stalin. Auf einer Akademie. Und doch habe ich allein, allein auf mich gestellt, ganz Europa erobert. Verräter! Von allem Anfang an bin ich so verraten und betrogen worden. Es wurde ein ungeheurer Verrat geübt am deutschen Volke. Aber alle diese Verräter werden bezahlen. Mit ihrem eigenen Blut werden sie bezahlen. Sie werden das saufen in ihrem eigenen Blut. Bitte, Gerda, jetzt beruhig dich doch. Meine Befehle sind in den Wind gesprochen. Es ist unmöglich, unter diesen Umständen zu führen. Es ist aus. Der Trick ist verloren. Aber wenn Sie, meine Herren, glauben, dass ich das mit Berlin verlasse, irren Sie sich gewaltig. Er jacke ich wie eine Kugel durch den Kopf. Tun Sie, was Sie wollen. 